Okay, um, are we ready for, to proceed from here? Can everyone hear me? Well, uh, as we get ready to start the meeting, I just want to take a quick minute uh, to share with my board colleagues uh, just an excerpt from an article that I've been reading. And what I will do is I will uh, have the secretary to, to actually copy this and get this to you. But it's, it's an older article. It was written about effective schools for the urban poor. It was written uh, by a gentleman by the name of uh, Ronald uh, Edmonds. And um, in this particular article, he goes through uh, a number of things of talking about what it takes to, uh, his research is basically around the seven correlates of effective schools. And so this, through this article, he just talks about a lot of the research he's done and the kinds of things that it takes to move uh, school districts that are serving uh, individuals that are considered poor or underprivileged. And so I wanna fast forward to the end of the article, but I'll make sure I share the article with you so that you can get a chance to read it in, in its entirety. But uh, at the end of his, his discussion, he simply says this, it seems to me therefore, that what is left of this discussion are three declarative statements. We can, whenever and wherever we choose, successfully teach all children whose schooling is of interest to us. He then further says, we already know more than we need to know to do that. And whether or not we do it must finally depend on how we feel about the fact that we haven't done it so far. So I wanted to share that with you. And what I do, I kind of keep this article close to me. And so as I go through the work that we're doing, I constantly go back and remind myself of the fact, how do I feel about the fact that we haven't done it so far? And so that's the thing that drives me and helps with the motivation in terms of the things that we're doing. So with that being said, let's go to the first item on the agenda, which is public recognition. Good evening, members of the board. Students, staff, and members of the community. Tonight, we'd like to say congratulations to the Normandy Early Learning Center, recipient of the Missouri PVIS Silver Award. The award recognizes the school's efforts to implement PVIS as a way to encourage a safe and positive environment for learning. This is the second consecutive year the ELC has received this honor. Special thanks to NELC counselor, Ms. Amanda Wilson, who spearheaded the school's efforts, Dr. Crystal Hunter, building leader, and the entire ELC staff. Our next recognition, uh, if they're on the call, I don't know if anybody can see them, they can wave and let us see them. Congratulations. Congratulations are also in order for three members of the staff at Washington School. Uh, we have three members there who recently earned advanced degrees. Marla May, third grade teacher, earned her master's degree in curriculum and instruction from Western Govern Governors University. Corliss Ann White, the school nurse, earned her master's degree in legal studies from Washington University. And lastly, Juanita Johnson, sixth grade teacher, earned her educational education specialist degree from Lindenwood University. Congratulations and way to go to all of those staff members. And that concludes my report. The next item on the agenda is the recognition of the Missouri Public Education Award. Can I get a motion to adopt the agenda? Can I get a second? It's been properly moved in second that the agenda would be adopted. Is there any uh, modifications to the agenda before we uh, pass the vote? Yeah, uh, I'd like to suggest a modification. Sure, go ahead. Uh, in the items for consent, uh, the JPPD meeting schedule at 20.10, I'd like to move to an item for uh, discussion, for item for approval, so that we can actually discuss the dates. Okay. So that's gonna be under item for action. That'll be under items for action. Uh, is okay. In, any other um, modifications to the agenda? Uh, yes, I'd like the uh, uh, item 5.02 personnel action to the second session. Okay. 
That's 5.02 being moved to executive session. Uh, any other modifications? We have a motion and we have a second and we have two modifications to the agenda. Uh, any other questions around the, the uh, motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, contrary? All right, those, those modifications will, will be dealt with as adjusted. Uh, the next item we have on the agenda is superintendent updates. Marcus Baldwin, you're correct. Thank you, sir. Are you all seeing it on your screen? No. No. I'm trying to step out and be brave with the orange. Thank you, Doc. Is it? I'm afraid I can operate it with this uh, clicker. It's not doing anything. Is it supposed to be lit up because it's not? Look at God. There, look at, hey, there we go. We have power. All right. <coughs> Good evening, folks. Good evening. I'm too excited. It was it was working, and I jinxed it. You just you just changed again. No, I didn't. Someone else did that. I think the battery is dying on this. Okay. Okay. Look at God. All right. So uh, four things on our agenda. First, um, a consideration of the uh, projects that are composed in proposition. V versus Proposition T um, and a discussion about uh, a way forward. 
um, I ready results from fall, winter, and spring um, throughout this uh, last school year, attendance uh, briefly during the MAP uh, assessment, and then uh, mandatory return to school. I will talk about quickly. Uh, but let's look at the, the construction projects that are underway. Um, for the benefit of Mr. Humphrey and Mr. Jones, uh, Normandy Next represents how we are branding our um, work going forward, our strategic plan that gets us to, to 2025. And so a lot, of, you'll see that a lot as we move through I suppose you're direct. All right, so now that we're under construction at the high school, it's important to step back and remind ourselves of the projects that are currently underway as well as those that remain to be funded. Uh, January 2021, the, the board had a, a really lengthy discussion around which projects would fit within the confines of which bond initiative. And voted at that time to ensure that the projects that were health, safety, and security related were all encompassed in uh, Proposition V, the no tax bond, with the remaining transformation projects to be included in Proposition T. So those Proposition V product projects were the West Hall Renovation and Central Connector, the Central Hall Renovation, East Hall Renovation, the secure campus connector and the bus lot uh, relocation. Mm -mm, too far. All right, so West Hall renovation is already underway and will complete by August, uh, the end of August in 2021. So when kids come back to school, this should be done. It's an update to all classrooms. That's floors, walls, um, that's furniture, um, taking down the old chalkboards. I don't even know where to buy chalk. We should have chalkboards across our campus uh, to put up whiteboards, uh, corridors, sta stairwells, and bathrooms, uh, which will include uh, new fixtures uh, in those areas. It's an expansion and combination of the high school cafeteria. There were two cafeterias, now there'll just be one large space. Uh, for our kids to occupy with a variety of seating arrangements depending on where you are in that large space. A complete overhaul of the cafeteria kitchen um, going from a traditional kind of food service pass through the line type of cafeteria to more of a food court uh, scenario where kids can go from station to station depending on the type of thing that they want to eat. That's all new equipment within that um, that kitchen and it allows us to do what we need to do to make sure that there aren't vermin um, in the space as the kids have reported to us in the past. Installs new student restrooms at the cafeteria where there have been no access. And so now for the first time, kids don't have to actually leave the cafeteria space to uh, use the restroom. Provides a dynamic space for career and technical education classes. Uh, that's fashion and marketing, that's entrepreneurship, that's coding, that's also um, our culinary arts program. And it establishes an open connection between West and Central Halls on the first and second floors. And so all those, those, although those two, two buildings are joined next to each other, there's no way to pass from one building to the other building. So on the first floor, you'll be able to go from the corridor near the band room in Central Hall directly into the cafeteria. And on the second floor, you'll be able to enter some of our CTE space uh, to directly from Central Hall. So we, we're creating the opportunity whereby this fall, kids can pass from Central to um, West without going outside. Um, as you might remember, the JEGB did vote uh, for this project to be in acceleration. And so the architects did have plans ready to go. Um, uh, we did kind of cross our fingers and believed in the voters and they came through. And so uh, we were ready to turn dirt as soon as, as that, that um, initiative passed and uh, is on track uh, for delivery. Central Hall is a big building. Um, it's gonna get new classrooms, corridors, stairwells, and bathrooms in the same way West Hall is. 
it will modernize our performing arts facilities. And so our band room, our choir room, it also adds a recording arts studio. Um, we're working with um, uh, Ms. Leslie McSpadden, God bless her. She helped us to put together a social justice institute uh, named for her son, uh, Mike Brown, who's a Normandy alum. Uh, we had great speakers uh, throughout that, that conversation, uh, folks like Al Sharpton and, and uh, Mayor Tashar Jones and um, Congresswoman Cori Bush. Uh, we're all leveraged through that partnership. She wants to establish a recording art studio, which was a passion of Michael's in Normandy High School uh, in his name. So um, working on uh, bringing that to fruition. It also expands and modernizes, modernizes our science and mathematics, mathematics classrooms. Uh, and laboratories uh, within the context of Central Hall. Um, in that the main office gets relocated, we get to take, take that space, space and use it for math and science uh, where it's currently administrative offices. And that should deliver by August of 2022. <laughs> East Hall is a significant project as you might imagine, the oldest building on the campus, uh, classrooms, corridors, that's, that's floors, that's ceilings, that's lighting. Uh, it's everything we need to do to modernize the space. Stairwells and bathrooms, including new bathrooms um, in East Hall, doesn't have sufficient restroom space, um, especially for adults who have complained about having to leave the building to actually use the restroom. There's a one little bitty bathroom tucked off behind a closet uh, near the little theater um, that adults have had to use. And so because we are relocating science, to Central, then we could take the science lab space in the East and create the kind of dynamic bathrooms that we need uh, for our kids and adults in that space. Um, it transforms the little theater into a modern lecture hall, converts the existing small gymnasium spaces into a uh, new library and media center. Uh, the current library and media center will become part of the corridor um, headed from East to Central. Um, provides seminar spaces and really serves as a hub for English, social studies, foreign language, and the fine arts departments. Also due to complete 2022. The Secure Campus Connector uh, provides a larger secured entrance to the facility for students and their families. As you know, our, our kids currently enter the space um, through a narrow hallway down by the band room. When families arrive on campus, uh, they are not greeted by um, an administrative assistant or a school administrator. They stop at a guard shack and then they're directed uh, where they should be going, behind which gate, um, once, that, once they are approved to actually enter the campus. The connector gives them a, a centralized place where we no longer find ourselves in a position to have to stage 50 or 100 kids outside trying to enter the building. Uh, because they got to go through metal detectors, they have to go through um, clear backpack checks, um, and um, to the extent we get comfortable, uh, mass temperature checks. All that becomes more viable in a bigger space, and we can do a better job of keeping out weapons, keeping out strangers, um, if we had a better space for, from which our students could um, enter, the, enter the school. It relocates the main office to the front of the school, improving student supervision and parental access. And so when you come to do business at Normandy, you, have, you know exactly where you need to go. Um, there'll be guest visitor parking uh, right up front. And so it'll be much easier for folks to be able to get in, transact the business they need to transact with the front office and to keep it moving. It connects East Hall to Central Hall, eliminating the needs for students to leave the building. Uh, with the exception of accessing the athletic spaces. In my mind, this is critical because one of the things I did not understand was how we were effectively supervising three school buildings uh, with the size of staff that we have. By uniting the school buildings, we not only make it a safer place to supervise, but we also create a buffer between the parking lot and the interior quad, which the kids want to use for the purposes of recreation and study. It'll make the kids feel safer because I'm now surrounded on all three sides by building one side by a uh, gate. Provide two new student common spaces that allow students to continue to work collaboratively beyond school hours. And so when we talked to our kids about what they wanted to see in their high school, they weren't really excited about colors or furniture configuration. They were, they were very concerned about security. Can you make this place feel safer? 
Um, that's not just about how we enter and leave the space. It's also about how we deal with student discipline. But they were also concerned about not destroying the family feel at Normandy High School. And so uh, the connector becomes essentially uh, the family room for our students uh, by virtue of the student common spaces that will be available before school and after school for kids to work collaboratively. Provides ADA access uh, to Central Hall and the third floor, I should say East Hall, by installing an elevator that uh, replaces the broken chairlifts. Currently, there's no ADA access to the third floor of East. I don't know why the elevator goes from the basement only up to the second floor, but it doesn't go to the third. This solves that problem in East Hall because you can go up in the connector and get over to the third floor of East. Um, Central Hall has some rusted, dilapidated chairlifts uh, that haven't been used in years. Uh, this solves the problem of being able to access the upper floors in Central um, and West for that matter because uh, there is an elevator there as well. So you can go to the second level in the connector and you can get into Central and into West on the second floor. Currently, we don't have any ADA access across those spaces. This solves that problem. Puts in a snack shop for students to access food after school hours uh, when our cafeteria is closed. And I mentioned uh, uh, providing a buffer. And so all three of those remaining projects, including the relocation of the bus lot, which is necessitated by uh, the creation of this campus connector. Uh, we're looking at some parcels on Lulu uh, adjacent to the school and right across from our bus garage to actually park those buses. All those things deliver by August of 2022. And because um, this board authorized the architectural to advance, um, we're able to keep those projects rolling and make sure that we deliver them quickly. So the, the question is, what didn't get done then if, um, if that's what happened in Proposition V? So you might say Proposition T is about holistic programming and pipeline development. It's, it's, it is about um, the strength of programs at the high school in athletics and fine and performing arts, but it's also about the entire district. Um, what, what does it mean to have Little League football? What does it mean to have um, Pee Wee? Basketball, what does it mean to develop a track and field program, junior choirs, junior marching band, etc. And so our ability to create pipelines um, all, I think, comes down to whether or not we have adequate facilities for the training and development of not just our high school students, but the kids um, across the continuum of grades in our school's community. So the first project is the West Athletic, Athletic Center expansion. There's currently there a dance room, a locker room, a, in my mind, undersized weight room for the size of our school and a small practice gym. Expanding it would give it two additional gym floors, bringing our campus total to four. Um, I, I continue to be disappointed but that you can only run one practice at Viking Hall, as large that building is but um, the cost of expanding the floor of Viking is prohibited. It is in the seven figures and it's not on the table. Um, so we'd, we'd have four gym floors that we can operate for basketball, volleyball, um, cheerleading and wrestling. Expands the fitness area to include a cardio area. And so you can lift tons of weight at Normandy High School. Uh, we have very few elliptical machines, uh, bikes, uh, treadmills, and this would add to that space. It renovates the girls' locker room and it creates a, a new boys' locker room um, that is the caliber that a high school should have. And in my mind, centralizes really where we would do most of our physical education activities. Viking Hall is the spiritual center of, of this school district. Um, it is a space that, that has a feel and we want to improve and modernize that field. Uh, new storefront, windows, doors, and metal framing at the front entrance. A renovated lobby, which includes new concessions, ticketing, restrooms, and an athletic hall of fame. Where do we celebrate our many accomplishments uh, from an athletic standpoint? Stadium seating to replace the bleacher seating um, on the south side of Viking Hall. And in my mind, we should at least contemplate what it would mean to replace all the bleacher seating and modernize it and standardize it across the facility, as opposed to going from decent bleacher seating on one side to, and, and bleachers on the other side, I mean, stadium seating on one side and bleachers on the other side to now brand new 
stadium seating and what would look like uh, pretty bad uh, stadium seating on the other side. A floating wood floor. Um, I do believe that um, the science is clear around kids running around on concrete. You know, we do have a wooden floor there. It is laid on top of concrete. We should definitely look at what it means to put a rubberized surface underneath our gym floor to protect the joints and, and bones and growth plates of our students. New scoreboards and audiovisual equipment. And um, I don't think the current project calls for um, ADA adjustments, Phil. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think graduation taught me that uh, we probably should solve that problem. Uh, we could take those back stairs and make a ramp at least. Um, so that if someone is in a wheelchair, they can access the facility. But currently, I think there's a chairlift somewhere that doesn't get any use and probably hasn't been serviced. Um, and we should really contemplate what it means to give all of our citizens access to Viking. It was. <laughs> A, a new community auditorium. Um, it's an erection of a 1,200 seat auditorium. Um, it also creates a storm shelter, which is required by local code when you do the scale of projects uh, that we're doing on campus. Um, that storm shelter needs to be uh, mostly of concrete. I would say probably 90% plus of it has to be of concrete. There has to be an adequate place for uh, the kids to be able to, to sit uh, should there be a storm. Um, a full proscenium stage for professional uh, performances, music and theater, uh, a rotating student art exhibit in the lobby slash art gallery, connects to the interior classroom buildings via East Hall. And so um, there'll be a, a pathway to be able to enter in the connector and then uh, go directly into the auditorium. State-of-the-art visual equipment for speeches, videos, and musical performances in this auditorium. Uh -oh. Is that my next slide? Wait. No, I skipped this line. Did it? Yep, there we go. Viking Stadium. Um, doesn't look like a whole lot, but there's a whole lot to be done at Viking. Uh, we have uh, damaged turf surfaces uh, there at Viking for which we have been cited. Um, actually, one of our elected officials said he as a, a referee hates to ref games at Normandy because of the condition of our field. Um, it would replace those damaged greens with artificial turf. It would rotate the track to add additional lanes and make it regulation. And so our kids can practice on our track, but they cannot compete at home because we don't have a regulation track for reasons I still don't understand. And the addition of the appropriate pits to do the other kind of field activities. New home and visitor bleachers. Um, it, hopefully those home bleachers would have a concrete pad underneath them so that we could create appropriate locker room space and equipment storage um, out at the field as opposed to having kids track across the parking lot uh, to access locker rooms um, during the football game. And so to modernize Viking Stadium, Mr. Humphrey would love to see us put lights up and have night games. Um, we're excited about his vision there. Um, but I think there's a real opportunity to talk about how we can make this an even more dynamic space. So we believe um, if we can effectively manage contingency funds and where possible assign certain costs to our ESSER three funds, which are about $30 million, then we can potentially pull a project from Proposition T into Proposition V. Um, Timing I'm not as clear on because um, uh, certainly the initial timing was predicated upon Proposition T passing in April. And so those timelines are probably not good, but we're studying the opportunity to complete the West Athletic Center uh -oh, uh, expansion in the first phase of our transformation work. Uh, so if we can, you know, we're, we're talking about what, what the green light um, dimensions are from a money perspective. How much money do we actually have to save before we say uh, we've saved enough to start this work? Um, but um, we went from curious to um, 
mildly optimistic to feeling pretty good about it. So we'll keep you updated um, as that, that goes down the tracks. So in Proposition 3, um, two very important insights uh, working on these initiatives. First, um, our constituents expect us to deliver on our promises. If we, if we don't deliver the projects we promised, then there is uh, a price to be paid in terms of our reputation. Um, I don't know that it's accurate, uh, but folks really feel like in the last uh, no tax bond initiative, they were promised changes and renovations that ultimately did not come to fruition. We take that very seriously. Um, whether that is changes to the high school or um, certain concepts with in how the early learning center was actually put together, the voters are paying attention. Uh, they do remember what you said and expect you to deliver on that. Um, second, that there has to be community input. And we're grateful that Ms. Marsh put together and established a, a community advisory committee that she's talked to this board about to be an important external voice um, in this work. And so we're grateful for the participation of folks like Mayor E.G. Shields of Pagedale, Mayor Terry Epps, who's class of 90, 1986, the Mayor Pine Law, Mayor Nathaniel Griffin of Wellston, Cheryl Jones, the CEO of Girls Incorporated, Dr. Aileen Phillips, who uh, manages the McKinley Center and Outreach for Harris Stowe uh, in our district. Carrie Collins, who directs educational initiatives for Beyond Housing. Chief Mark Hall uh, of the Normandy Police Department and uh, Mary Avery. And so they had their first meeting last week and the conversation was robust and they're ready to roll up their sleeves uh, with the charge of first, holding us accountable, holding our feet to the fire relative to getting done the things that we said we would get done, we promised the voters. Then secondly, talking about how we prioritize these transformation projects, uh, what's most important, what's not so important. Um, like we think Viking Hall is very important. We can might come back and say, we think an auditorium is more important than Viking Hall. And so we'd rather have an old basketball stadium in a new pool. We don't know that. And so this community advisory committee will help us to gauge what the right projects are um, as we move forward. I feel like I should probably go through this all and then oh, yeah. questions to come back. Uh, moving on then from our construction projects to IRS, IREADY diagnostic data. Uh, so grateful to um, Dr. Ryder and her team um, as well as the folks across the district who've made this work. You have no idea how challenging it is to do regular school stuff in the midst of a pandemic, um, especially when the kids, for the most part, <coughs> are at some distance. Um, and this team has done a yeoman's job of ensuring that as best as they possibly can, they provide a great opportunity for kids. Um, as you can see from um, those, those three sets of bars represent, those, those windows represent fall, winter, and spring. Um, our greatest participation was in the spring, I mean the winter. Uh, we had some fall off um, in the spring, but we do still think that uh, we're looking at mostly comparable numbers relative to student participation. Um, and this spring I already window, you know, opens right as we're gearing up to try to really focus on map participation and getting our district over 85% participation uh, with the Missouri Assessment Program. So this looks at, um, try to get this to where I can see it. This looks at uh, reading progress um, for tier three, which is um, two years below tier one, tier two, which is one year below and tier one on grade level. So as you can see across those windows, um, our students moved from 24% in um, tier one to 32% in tier one with reading. You see the, the numbers um, moved down from 46% to 39% uh, in tier three. And so the good news is in the midst of a global pandemic where everybody was worried about kids losing, um, that uh, the kids in Normandy were actually stable to actually getting better uh, in reading. 
Uh-oh. And this gives one more. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> this gives you individual student growth, and um, you can see how many kids were scoring in um, which rank, which range, um, and that those numbers move just like you'd want them to move, right? Like the the kids who are below actually. Uh, that number is decreasing while the kids who are on grade level or above grade level, those numbers are getting higher. When we move to math, we see a similar story. Um, you know, none of this is uh, the kind of story that we want to tell in Normandy, which is 50%, 80%, 95%. Uh, but it is progress um, in one of the most challenging uh, times. Now, this isn't 100% of our kids, right? Like window one, 15, 87, window two, 16, 95, 15, 47. We, we haven't tested all of our kids. However, for the kids that we are able to engage and who have been participating, we do see growth. And the same story is true in math, right? The, the bad numbers, the three more grade levels below, you want that number to decrease while you want the kids on grade level or above to, to increase. And, and we've seen that. And this is without the benefit of an intervention program, um, how we intend this year to extend the school day, how we intend this year to utilize weekends when we can, how we intend this year to transform our targeted uh, interventions for summer in uh, 2022. Moving on the map, every school district has to test 85% of its student population. Um, and if it doesn't, they have to open the testing window for the fall, which for us would be incredibly disruptive. Our kids are coming back to school. We need to get them hyper-focused on our new uh, culture playbook. We need to get them down to business in terms of learning and growth. And the last thing we want is to take two or three weeks uh, doing map testing. And we don't have official numbers as of yet, but in our last conversation, we believe we've exceeded that threshold and continue to test more students. Look at that. Hats off to um, all the folks across the district who've done non-traditional things relative to testing. We brought kids in later in the day, uh, fed them in some cases lunch and dinner uh, to access that. We've done some individualized testing. I don't exactly think we've like driven to somebody's house and tested them in their driveway, but we're at least willing, I think, to be outside the box. That is going to represent what makes Normandy different. How do we become the resource that the kids need and meet them at the place where they are? And so um, a lot of people expected us to struggle with this, and I'm just so grateful for the coordination of um, Dr. Ryder and the principals to ensure, and all the other folks, all the secretaries who, who called home, all the teachers who got engaged, all the folks like Dr. Barnes and others who threw their hat in the ring to proctor test, all these people basically threw in and made sure that this happened the way it needed to happen. And finally, um, we are returning to school in person uh, this fall. Um, uh, we've got a group, a, a small group here with uh, Dr. Pusateri, Dr. Harris, um, and Miss um, Sims Williams working on a reentry plan. We plan to over communicate with our families. We tend to have um, one big enrollment fair or one big kind of back to school bash on a parking lot. And our intention is not to do that this year, but to basically take the mountain to Muhammad. And so we currently plan four block parties where we intend to go into some of our more populated communities, shut down the street, um, DJ, a lot of noise, uh, but you have all the information you need from uniforms to enrollment and registration, uh, meet your principal, um, activities, hot dogs, uh, you name it. So uh, we're going to take the word to the community that we are open to all of our kids. So right, so so far, Pagedale, Pine Lawn, Russell, and Belder Village Hills, those mayors have signed on uh, to uh, help us host a block party in their community. But we still need to improve our uh, communication strategies. We've got to reach more and more folks if we expect our attendance to be above 90% uh, that threshold that we set, the state is set for us. 
and I'll take any questions. Mr. Jones, any questions? No. Uh, Ms. Williams, any questions? toilets, new sinks, new mirrors, doors. New girls, I mean, yes, ma'am. New mirrors. Uh, we're talking about new flooring in all the restrooms. We're also talking about new partitions as well. Okay. And so they get a full facelift. And is that a standard? Um, is that true for all restrooms? Or is that just some? All those that have been included in Proposition V. And so you won't see new restrooms in West unless we can include it. Um, through some finagling of budget, you won't see new restrooms at uh, the stadium or in Viking Hall. But across the footprint, you should see new restrooms. And additional restrooms, right? Like we don't have enough um, toilet space um, at Norman High School. So we're not only updating the restrooms that exist, but we're adding new ones uh, in places where they're desperately needed, like um, the cafeteria in West Hall, as well as East Hall. Yeah. Um... I have a question about the, the uh, cost of a, um, I guess, 22nd century uh, class. Mm -hmm. um, as we go about this thing, uh, when we are looking at furniture and, and so forth, walls and ceilings and everything, but the, I think one of the keys right now is technology. Mm -hmm. So how highly equipped <laughs> will our classroom um, yeah. or moving forward with uh, the, this innovation that has come on us sure. with technology. Sure. So the, the um, I'm not sure that we have, I don't know whether we have or not, but I do know we have having these failures in, in uh, technology. Mm -hmm. And I know you said that uh, uh, Dr. Green had made a, a nuance or had made a partnership with somebody else because the other one wasn't strong enough. Something like, that. something like that. Anyway, I don't know anything about all of that. Sure. Anyway. All I know is I need to know whether or not every classroom that we're dealing with yes. will be as not up to date. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Sure. <laughs> that's the word. That's the word. Sure. Uh, state of the art. Um, and so it was concerned a little bit when we talked about the uh, uh, chair and the table mm -hmm. that we purchased for the classroom there. We said, well, the bill said, and he will always say this. Mm -hmm. Well, we tried that, but it was too expensive. That's his favorite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so uh, if we're going to use ESSA funds to help support us, yes. okay, let's, let's see if we can't get these stuff. This yeah. is a once in a lifetime thing. We're not gonna we, we have a hard time getting the, the bond funds as it is. Mm -hmm. But now we can have extra funds. Right. So let's go for it. Uh, that's the way I think. Yeah. And the other thing is we do have 29 million, 26, 29 million for the high school. So I don't want us to forget that we have some elementary middle schools around here who might be able to help too that's right. when we talk about the extra. Yeah. So to, to respond to your first question, Mr. Hofer and I actually had this conversation um, about technology. I would have been really worried about that 15 years ago because technology is predicated upon making sure you have the appropriate right, uh, wiring 
and outlets to make it go, i.e. somebody has to make sure there's power sitting in Lola's room. We have to make sure that that pole is attached to something above the ceiling grid that is um, sturdy enough to be able to hold it. At this particular juncture, the technology has evolved so much that it isn't now dependent upon being in a particular place. And so we do need to have electricity, definitely you hang an interactive whiteboard on the, on the wall, but that interactive whiteboard no longer needs a projector because it can connect wirelessly to the computer. You can just connect through Bluetooth. All that being said, we're less concerned um, at this juncture about making sure we have all the pre-wiring because we don't need to pull the same level of either cat fiber, fiber optic cat cable. We don't have to do the same kind of electrical work that we needed to do 15 years ago. You have to be very precise about where the outlets were 15 years ago. And that just isn't the case uh, anymore. So I'm, I'm not concerned that we're not gonna be able to do the technology um, that we need to do. I think we're in good shape as far as that's concerned. Yeah, just wanna add the follow-up to uh, Sue's question. Uh, to the extent the analysis of technology changes rapidly, how, how does technology influence construction and how we need accommodating or or adjusting or dealing with that both for, on the student side as well as the, 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 the teacher side yeah i think that's an evolving conversation um and we're still not settled on the answer to that question uh normally made a, a big investment when the pandemic hit to go one-to-one -one in terms of devices to students. Uh, and so not every kid has a machine. The ripple from that in terms of the professional development, like how do you then use that as part of the lesson as opposed to just a fancy electronic textbook, it's a whole different matter. Um, and so Dr. Barnes um, has done some extensive training around a program called Go Guardian. That may be a way for us to uh, better connect with kids in the classroom using those devices. But it, it remains to be seen how we completely leverage it. So during the pandemic, it was everything. It's Google Classroom, it's Zoom, it's Nearpod, it's all of the online instructional deployment portals that we need to get the information to the kids. Once they're back, now there's a question about like, is this just a fancy typewriter or is it more than that? You, did you have, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, the cost of that state of the art classroom. How much money is going how into a classroom? Does it cost, not just one classroom, that is state of the art. What's the cost of it? Then I can I multiply it by the 19 classrooms in <laughs> the 20th century and so forth. I just tell you yeah. one classroom cost. I don't know that we've done a prototype. Uh, to be able to, I don't know that we've done a prototype and, and maybe some of that is because the central and east um, designs are not completed yet, as yet and west is unique and so a west classroom might look like a, a regular classroom but we've got a fashion and merchandising classroom that looks way different it's bigger it has different kinds of furniture the culinary arts classrooms are bananas and so it's hard to predict based on that what we think the standard classroom cost would be i will say that hey, we have we got more we got culinary arts on the special things we got science class on this sure but one regular state-of-the-art classroom cost where we teach social studies, sure. whatever it is, yeah, we, in that we can get you a plug number four. So we no. know, uh, going to teach, uh, it's important to me. I know I keep at this. <laughs> Some people in this room are sick of me talking about, but I think <laughs> they are. <laughs> okay, I'm here. Uh, so uh, I really, really, really want to get down to the point where I can be confident that when we're through with this, these children and teachers are living in the best classroom they can have. Sure. Okay. And, and uh, while I would say I can get you a plug number, that really doesn't answer, answer your question. Because the nuance behind, behind your question is not just what does it cost to do the classroom, 
but how do you define say the art? And so in West, for instance, we're gonna put down vinyl composite tile, which for some people is really nice. It's an upgrade over what's currently on the floor. For some folks, it looks cheap. But those are the kind of conversations we have. And this is why I'm grateful that West is proceeding because it gives us a basis for conversation to be able to say, we like this, replicate this for Central. We hate this, don't do this again. Okay. And so the real answer to your question comes down to not just what things cost, but what are the things? And so I think the it's worth it in the next two months when we get in the West to be able to do an evaluation and say, we are satisfied with the quality that we see presented here, or we are dissatisfied with the quality that we see. As my team knows, I hate vinyl composite tile. They don't even show it to me. And so I know what's going in, but I won't look at it. That's just how much I dislike it, right? But I don't want to blow up the budget for something actually once it's down might look very attractive. Uh, but if it doesn't look attractive, we're not going to do it two more times in Central and East. We'll find the resources to be able to go in with some decently priced um, tile that is an upgrade. Mike, let, let me catch Karen okay. next, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. Karen, do you have any questions? Are you done? Really Sheila, are you done? No, no I'm going to hush. No, All right. <laughs> Karen. <laughs> and so, since we're talking about West Harlem, the question I had in that, when you talked about being in progress, what specific projects are you working on that are in progress? So what percentage and does it look like that, that we're, we are on track? It doesn't seem like that, you know, of course, it's, you know, whenever you start tearing up something, you always find something else. Yeah. Um, I think we've hit a, a bump in the road relative to one of our culinary arts uh, classrooms. We'll talk about that later in the agenda because there's a change order associated with it. But other than that, I don't think we found any real bumps. Right, we're on track about 18% through as of two weeks ago. So uh, that's with all the work. Marcus Moody is coming tonight. One of the latest presentations is going to be in the center presentation. Lots of pictures. Okay. 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 Uh, the other thing that I did like when we were talking about the recording uh, studio, that is, you know, that, that his mother is uh, partnering with you. That, yes, ma'am. That was his idea. How did that, that come about in, in that? You know, there have been, been a number of conversations between the principals and the assistant principals at the high school mm -hmm. with Ms. McSpadden mm -hmm. uh, to get her engaged and, and to get her connected. Also, Dwayne Foster was uh, Mike's music teacher and supported his love for, thirst for the recording arts mm -hmm. and has been trying to get a recording arts studio at Norway High School for some time now. Okay, well, I mean, that, that is really great. So um, I, you know, applaud you on that one. Uh, the other thing I wanted to applaud you on too was the, uh, the community advisory committee. You said you, that you guys met, uh, met a week ago. So how was that? How was the, the response? So Yeah, I mean, the energy is incredible. And um, the, the level of not just questions, but recommendations that they put on the table mm -hmm. uh, was exceptional. And so we haven't set the second meeting yet, but um, you all are definitely invited. I think, I think mm -hmm. you'd enjoy the conversation. And it's, um, a, I think, a very diverse group of folks from disparate parts of, of our community. And so we'll, we'll be benefited by that feedback, I think, tremendously. Yeah. Okay. Good. But they're like excited, said, so am I. Yeah, because you know, like we were saying, that that was one of our uh, big hits going forward with the bond. Uh, it kept coming back, like we didn't have enough input. We didn't try hard enough with the, with the community. So because you're going forward with that, so I applaud you on that one. And I do like that uh, about the reading and the math uh, participation rates. You know, so at least it seemed like it's creeping on up there or at least stabilizing. It wasn't like we had a complete nosedive on that. So um, anyway, I think that was my, and yay, block party. So, okay, I'm there. Sir, you have any questions? I do, thanks. Uh, questions and comments. So um, first, when you're talking about the updates on Prop B and Prop T, and you mentioned um, uh, when you're talking about Viking Hall, 
uh, maybe updating and having this athletic wall of fame. I think we ought to consider uh, other walls of fame. So maybe in the music area, there's a performing arts uh, wall of fame, or even when you get to the new auditorium, which is so far down the road, I don't know that I want to count on that. So, um, but in the updated music facility, you could do that. We've got wonderful, wonderful talent, or even in West Hall, when you're talking about some of the other uh, areas that students study a wall of fame. Um, you know, I'm the costume designer. Uh, we have that uh, Emmy award winning uh, costume designer and just have a wonderful celebrate all sorts of successes, not 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 only athletic successes. Um, also, um, let's see, uh, I ready scores. So uh, when will we see the full breakdown by grade in school? I, I love the, the trend, but last time we saw by building, by grade, and the number of students, and, and um, that'll be July. Okay, great, wonderful. And uh, you said before that iReady aligns with MAP, uh, the MAP testing, right? So we should we feel, told. we are told. <laughs> okay, all right, just uh, uh, talking about that. And then uh, I love the ideas around reentry and the block parties and uh, going to the different communities and not just expecting everyone to come to our campus. I think that's fabulous. So whoever created all those ideas, thank you, thank you. It's wonderful. <laughs> and um, then also the um, community advisory group, love that. Um, I think we also need to really focus on parent advisors too. So I'd love to have a parent committee, uh, really get parents engaged, make sure we've got uh, parents from each building, um, you know, multiple grades um, and just get, get, get them engaged in that too. So I, I'd suggest that we do that next and that's it, but nice, nice update. Uh, Mr. Neal, you have any questions? Sure, one, one question and one comment. I didn't hear anything you mentioned about the lockers. And that's a great theme, I think, uh, as we score this <laughs> yeah. school, you know, so if you can speak a little bit about that. And also, um, the community advisory board, I really like that, that, that group. There are a number of teachers that live in the community that retire this year. Have you considered re-engaging those teachers to be a part of the community advisory group? I think that would be a great way. Makes sense. Involved. They've been in the district for a long time. And, you know, a few years, several. And somehow bringing in a student voice in that community group, you know, maybe a couple students. I think that would be it. Awesome. That's a really good point about students. The students that talked to us at the retreat. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely wonderful comments. Yeah. Really informed us. And I'm you, know, you, you had some other questions? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, kind of do a follow-up uh, to share those questions. Before we do that, can I answer this question? Sure, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was all I was talking about part. Um, there are lockers that were boarded up in the West. We don't intend to bring the lockers in West Hall back. All the lockers in Central and East will be replaced and not bolted so the kids cannot use them. And so when this project is over, kids will have full-size lockers that are brand new that they can store their, their stuff. Okay. Mike, just, uh, and, and I probably got this wrong, I don't know if it's a pedagogical problem or issue, but wouldn't the, the, the question of what the state of the art classroom is, whatever the cut, be tied to exactly how we figure out how to use it in an instructional standpoint, because you could end up with a state of art classroom that ends up not being functional just because we haven't found a way to integrate the technology to the instruction. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. um, mm -hmm. Potentially, I will say that I'm less concerned about that because the, text, the, the technology is more flexible and malleable. Whereas once upon a time, it was really based on wiring. And if you didn't have the wiring right, then you were done for. To a certain extent, we still have like electrical issues. Like even we have these little devices, how do you plug them up, keep them charged and that type of thing. Yeah. Um, but that's not as significant an issue as it used to be. Um, right now, I think the issue is how do you make 
the classroom aesthetically look like you care about the kids in the classroom with appropriate access to whiteboards, interactive whiteboards, um, so that the classroom becomes a learning space. <clears throat> then from there, you can always bring in the technology as you need it. Yeah, but and, and I was really kind of speaking to the second point, and that, that, that's just that all of these flexible tools being part of the instructional uh, uh, discipline, et cetera, so that they're actually in use and you're maximizing what they can do with the instruction, I mean, the student learning. That's really what I was referring to, not whether they were the mechanics of them or not. No, we actually just, um, Dr. Green has um, an um, education technology person that just joined us today uh, that will be working and leading our strategy on answering that very question. Yeah. One, one more piggyback, then you can talk in a minute. You've got the whole floor. I just wanted, I just wanted to uh, um, co-sign on what uh, uh, Tony was saying about the students. At, at, because I was thinking, we used to have a student member of this board, and it always kept us connected to the children. They come back, they give us feedback, they talk to us, we, they look at policies, all the kinds of things that, um, the kind of feedback we needed. So I would like to propose that we have a student member of the school board once again. Well, you know, that, that was actually, well, see, that was actually on my list because we, we actually have a policy that indicates that we should have a student board member. So that, that's something that, you know, now we're, we're getting on this side of COVID, I just think we just need to make that a reality. Uh, the comments that I have, I guess, uh, the one thing I know, now are teachers also using Chromebooks as, as students are? We, yeah, Chromebook. Okay, now are, are their Chromebooks robust enough to be able to handle all of the technology and stuff that they're dealing with? Okay, because I know I've, I've heard a little bit saying that, you know, there were some issues around them not having enough capacity to do some of the things that they're doing. But uh, the other thing that I had, I know last month we talked about, uh, at least I mentioned that it would be good to see actual numbers of kids that took the map in May. And in that presentation, I didn't see those numbers. So I still would like to see those numbers come forward to know how many, how many students we have tested. Um, other than that, I don't have any other comments. I think, I think the progress that we're making is admirable. I think that uh, uh, I like the idea of the, uh, uh, you know, taking the, the back to school to the community because that's, that's going to create a synergy in the community uh, that, you know, that's been missing for a while. So I think that's something uh, that will be very, very helpful going forward. Um, any other comments around the presentation before I move away from it? Okay, at this point, we're now at the items for consent agenda. Can I get a motion uh, to, uh, to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item 5.02 that will move to exact session in uh, 5.10 uh, JEDV meeting schedule, which will move to 7.04. So, so moved. Get a motion? So moved. We got a motion. Do we have a second? There's been a motion and second that the, uh, the items for Yes, ma'am. A uh, motion came from uh, from Sarah, and the second came from uh, Mr. Jones. Okay, so uh, we have a motion and we have a second uh, on the item for consent agenda. Is there any discussion on the motion? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody contrary? All right, approved as outlined. The next item we have up. Um, a budget. Okay, we now have, uh, we're at uh, 7.01, approved the amended 2020-21 budget. So at this point, we'll, we'll move in that direction. Thank you, Mr. Pusateri. Um, the team is working to help me share my screen. There's just one slide and the board members have it in front of you on the 2021 budget amendment, the final amendments of this year. And it's minimal changes from last month, uh, briefly. Okay. Briefly, those changes are, um, we identified that we were budgeting fairly conservatively in a number of areas, uh, especially around expenses. 
and we just had a truing in this last month. Um, it's all pretty good news for fund balances. Uh, local revenue, we identified that delinquent taxes were more than we thought. Uh, we identified the basic formula, the way we had coded it, there's a little more than we thought. Uh, expenses, we identified that we were being conservative with uh, elementary staffing and we recognized that the truing is that there was fewer staff and expenses than we had projected, even with last month's uh, budget amendment. Same with food service facilities and the superintendent's office. We had thought that we were gonna have some expenditures and as we start to sharpen our pencil at the end of the year, they're, they're just not happening. They were budgeted and they're not occurring. That to us translates into uh, helping our fund balances, which puts us in a better position, position for the next presentation, which is a lengthier presentation. So if you're paying really close attention to the 2021 amended budget on uh, the spreadsheet, you might notice that architecture was recoded from the finance and operation uh, line to the construction line, it was just a coding correction. Same way with uh, Bikini Vento transportation was moved from contracted transportation to uh, disadvantaged services. And that's so we can make sure we can get our title one reimbursement. So just some minor stuff, but you might, might have noticed it if you got your magnifying glass out on the spreadsheet. Uh, we are looking at uh, end at about a 25 and a half percent fund balance. I believe that it will be a little bit higher than that. At this time, are there any questions about the amended budget for this school year, the final amended budget for this year? Any questions? Do we want to go around? Or uh, just? Well, at this point, uh, I was going to first ask for a motion to approve the amended 2021 budget. Can I get a motion? So moved. Can I get a second? It's been properly moved and second. Is there any, any question on the motion? Any questions? Still any questions? Any questions, Karen? No. Any questions? Uh, just a comment, Phil, on the, um, the balance, the new year balance is crazy. Uh, so um, I know we were being very thrifty. I mean, it is what it is. So it's not as though anything's going to change, but um, it helps us head into the next school year in a better position. So, so that's a good thing. So um, I know we'll get into the 21-22 budget which takes the balance way down. So we're gonna take some of what we have this year and Absolutely. help fund, okay. And even this is something that we're gonna take more than just a two year or three year ban. Uh, we need to be aware of the possibility of enrollment not rebounding. And most of us are predicting it is gonna rebound and this last year has just been a down year mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, but this will help us in case that worst case, those worst case scenarios do occur, this will help us weather the storm over multiple years. Okay. Nice job managing everything. Thanks. Mr. Neal, any questions? No questions. All right, we have a motion and a second uh, to approve the uh, 2021 budget uh, as amended. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone contrary? All right, next item is 2021-22 uh, 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 budget for the school district. Okay, and for the 20, uh, I'm gonna talk about a handful of things today. Uh, only a handful of slides as well, but uh, the punchline is that we're looking at about a 17 and a half percent fund balance at the end of next year's budget. So about a year from now. Um, in general, that's still pretty solid and will prepare us for the following year when we see a larger drop in state revenue um, unless our enrollment goes back up. So we're always mindful of that. I'm gonna talk about revenue projections then I'm gonna break expenditures down into kind of four different categories. One is new expenditures that are funded through ESSER two. One is just a return to normal costs. One are some highlighted uh, expenditures for next year. And then also a reminder that these, uh, of the expenditures that are aligned with the strategic plan. First revenue, uh, it's a reassessment year. We do see anticipate a little bit of a jump. Uh, housing prices in our community have gone up. Um, however, we will see about one and a half million dollar drop as a result of enrollment decline. Um, and that if it doesn't get better next year, that drop from the, at the state level will be even greater next year. As you look at this slide though, you can see that there's 14 million that we are anticipating uh, coming in next year from ESSER two. This is a flexible number. This is our projected number based on what we have slotted and slated now to spend. But we'll be coming and bringing before you uh, budget revisions just like we have in prior years. And that may include more or less ESSER money. As Marcus had said earlier, 
there's an additional 30 million still out there that we have not yet, uh, that's not yet referred to here. Of that ESSER money, uh, more than half it go, it will be going to capital and uh, less to operating, which is more day-to-day -day operations. Let's talk about ESSER expenditures. So operating expenditures, this is general day-to-day, -day, the general fund and also the teacher's fund. Um, much of this is one-time expenses. So we're not really using this grant money for uh, recurring expenses uh, mindlessly, which is uh, kind of the curse of big grants. Uh, lots of times nonprofits will know that you shouldn't do that. Um, instead, we're looking at those one-time purchases that Sheila and Marcus and the team and the group was talking about earlier. Uh, we have 3.2 million set up for furniture and general supplies. Uh, and generally that's gonna be tied to the Normandy High School renovation. In addition, another 200,000 in IT. Uh, those numbers can be flexible uh, based on our needs as well. So one way to answer that, Sheila, your question might be to divide that 3.4 million among the number of classrooms. And then if you needed a number, then that would be a way to do it. I, I think you were trying to maybe go the other way. How much is it one classroom and then multiply? But it's, it's, it's one way to look at it. Uh, other one-time expenses, again, we, we, we are using, uh, Mr. Robinson is using, all, we're all committed to uh, basically we have these extra funds, let's go ahead and spend with this one-time space. Uh, one is the uniform purchase that the board approved last month. In addition, there's facility supplies that'll be uh, supporting at nearly half a million. Uh, and we'll have some continued, a little bit of continued kind of COVID mitigation costs, but most of those uh, were spent uh, this school year that's ending. We are uh, intentionally, with intention, um, offsetting some of our current costs with ESSER funds. And some of those costs include um, nurses, and we're expanding our nursing program slightly to have them um, overlap with our HR department to assist us with workers' comp, as well as to provide nursing uh, services at our CASA, CASA location, as well as during summer school. Um, curriculum, certainly ESSER funds are uh, intended, can be intended for curriculum. IT, another uh, additional cost there for IT, over half a million. And then those uh, key leadership positions in instruction, very closely aligned with our strategic plan, the math and literacy uh, assessment, uh, math and literacy coaches, as well as the directors of data assessment and math, instructional quality, those will be coming from the ESSER funds as well um, because they're, it's eligible and it's gonna help us not to continue. If we did spend our regular fund balances on that, um, then we are spending it down when ESSER funds are there. We're, we're looking for a longer term uh, preservation of our balances. Then there's 7.4 million in capital for ESSER. Certain return to normal expenses. Uh, these are some of the reasons why our fund balances are big this year is because we haven't been spending these this year. Um, Guinea Vental Transportation is usually north of 500,000. Uh, food service staffing, we haven't filled those positions. Uh, we anticipate Expenses going back up in transportation. Uh, security staffing, we're returning to normal. And then early learning center as well. Uh, Dr. Hunter has identified and projected uh, kindergarten enrollment to come back up again. And then just in, in some of our inboxes today, they're saying this kind of a national trend, a number of folks are anticipating. A lot of folks who might not have been uh, sending their students to kindergarten last year because of the pandemic now are. So, but Dr. Hunter had projected that a few months ago. Uh, all that is just return to normal expenses of the same budget. Other uh, expenses we wanted to point out, make sure that everybody's aware of, there is the two-step increase for staff on the teacher scale, and that's uh, almost uh, 700,000. Uh, there is key class size decreases at the first grade and then at the seventh and eighth grade. And uh, Mr. Robinson had worked with the curriculum team to identify those key grade levels as kind of key gateways first grade being a key uh, early literacy space, and then seventh and eighth grade being kind of the sink or swim years for middle schoolers as they get ready for high school. Um, so making those class sizes smaller, we think was gonna strategically lead to outcomes for our students. Um, Bessie's recommendation was somewhere around 17 to 25 students in first grade, and we're gonna be moving to somewhere closer to 15 to 20 students in first grade to make sure that that individualized instruction is taking place. Uh, we look at those insurance costs, our claims 
to premiums data uh, hasn't looked good basically through March. Uh, Ms. Foster has been involved in some of our insurance conversations, um, but we are, um, insurance is out to bid. So we may not be coming back with UHC. We're gonna be going with the vendor who present, presents the best overall offer and they'll be working with our committee. Um, if the prices are up, then this 350,000 will go towards those, to those prices. But also Mr. Robinson and the team are looking at in what ways can we increase board paid insurance fees for certain employee costs. So we're gonna to wanna to look at how we compare with other districts. And if our insurance isn't good for say, uh, teachers with children, then we might look at ways that we can offset the cost to those uh, employees. There is a insurance committee uh, that goes through this planning process and there's also an insurance survey out there and we'll be using data from both of those sources to inform these decisions. We should have uh, bids back next month approximately and I'll be keeping, uh, Ms. Foster is typically the board member who we keep apprised of that uh, as we work through insurance and, and we'll be keeping it updated. Uh, next year will be the very last year for the transfer program. There's only a handful of students uh, left and uh, Clayton notified us that uh, they'll have no more students. There's just a few more left in uh, Francis Howell. So that'll be an expense reduction. Um, Ms. Robinson has identified possible way to, what if we could incentivize staff to be fully vaccinated? Uh, we all know that uh, fully vaccinated, the, the more adults who are fully vaccinated, the safer envi the environment will be. We've checked with legal and uh, that where we're clear. Uh, Ms. Robinson's still working through that. He's making sure he has enough uh, checking in with, uh, I believe, the, the NEA and others to uh, work out the details of the program. Uh, but we're setting some money aside for that. And uh, Mr. Robinson and the team have also wanted to make sure we set aside some uh, recognition for the hard work of staff. And I'm not exactly sure how that's all going to play out. There's a few ideas out there. Uh, we're looking back to maybe 2016 when, as a pre uh, predecessor event when we were able to recognize kind of the hard work of staff during some difficult times and uh, we set aside some money for that as well. So those are the select expenses I wanted to point out to you. And finally, um, the strategic plan drives our expenses beyond just our normal operating uh, expenses, but we wanted to point out the ways that some of our expenses align with certain strands. So strand one, engaging environments, uh, the addition of the deans this year and they're continuing next year. The attendance department, uh, which used to be Wyman had uh, some involvement in in the past, but now we have a budget behind and we have staff behind and we have a plan behind uh, the AR, the uh, plan related to attendance, um, ART, uh, as well as the uniforms. All those are aligned with strand one, strand two, the curriculum, the math and literacy coaches, the directors, and the continuity between IT and, uh, and curriculum and instruction. Um, all that work is aligned to strand two. And then strand three, top talent, how do we recruit and retain folks? Uh, a lot of the professional learning work that Dr. Barnes is working through, um, HR recruiting systems improvements, as well as insurance and health. It's all aligned to strand three, uh, top talent. So. It's important to remember that alignment. At this time, uh, what questions, do you have any questions about the next year's budget? Well, at this point, you, you've heard the presentation. I, I, would, uh, I would entertain a motion at this time to adopt the 2021-22 uh, budget. Uh, can I get a motion? Uh, can I get a second? Is there any discussion on the budget? Uh, Mr. Jones, any questions? Yeah, I Okay. Williams. Okay, Ms. Williams, do you have any questions? I would like to have at some point, whether we vote to approve it or not, um, this this document, I, I would like to have a, a kind of like a workshop. This, I, 
I haven't had enough time to really go through this and understand what you are talking about. I, I appreciate the assumptions, but then we had a lot of questions around those. And uh, this, uh, the, the uniform purchase should be under recurring costs, should it not? Not a one-time cost, is it? The first, the first is kind of the time when everybody buys it for the first time. And I, I don't, my assumption, I, in my experience, when I've done this before for a different LEA was that the very first time is expensive. And after that, it's recurrence. And I, after that, um, this, it's it's not going to be the same. You, you don't have to buy quite the same amount for everybody. In addition, that estimate is a higher estimate than uh, it's a very conservative kind of safe estimate. For the Your LEA was around what? Very small. Two, yes, I yeah. thought so. So that's all. Okay. Nothing else. Ms. Pierre, any questions? Yes, uh, I just needed a little clarification uh, about the effort uh, spending. So, you're saying with the recurring costs. Muted, muted. It's all of us on that. I'm muted now. I just need more clarification about the uh, the ESSER uh, funds that under the recurring costs. So this this it won't be an issue then with us. Do we need more um, clarification? Do we need uh, do, do we need somebody to tell us? Yes, you can go ahead and, and use this for nursing and uh, IT and so forth, and it's not going to be a backlash. Or what's the? I just want to make sure. So, yeah. So the the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has provided solid number of trainings on how to spend. Um, it's each incarnation of ESSER is more and more inclusive of what's allowable. And it all aligns with uh, ESEA, which is essentially everything that's in Title I related to teaching and learning. Um, so in general, if it's related to teaching and learning, it's related to serving the whole child or teaching and learning, uh, especially related to children who are coming from higher poverty backgrounds. Um, it's gonna be for the health and wellness of a child or uh, anything related to COVID prevention. Um, it's a very, very broad category. We did submit a budget to DESE and it has been approved. Most of this is on the budget that's been approved, if not all. On occasion, we can edit, uh, edit their budget and seek reapproval. But this is, this is good and coverable. Yes, sir. Okay, I just want to make sure nothing was coming back to bite us. Yeah. And you said that and this is our final year with the transfer program. Next year, we'll be finally Next year. Just a handful of students. Okay. What's a, in your estimate, what's a handful? I think I think uh, five is the best. Oh. So, yeah, very few. A traditional hand. Yeah, we're on yeah. it. <laughs> for Zoom World. I, I, for Zoom World, or not for Zoom World, uh, Friends of South. But I need to get the numbers on the board. I think some of it is going to be us having those conversations with them every once in a while. The district. You know, they'll see a child who's ready to go leave the fifth or fifth month through five school over the sixth grade, and then they may say, hey, can you pay us for this? And, and our support services team catches that. But the agreement is you only go through that ending grade level, one through five. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Ms. Wells, any questions? Uh, yeah, a couple questions. Um, so uh, you mentioned in here the possible staff incentive for vaccinations. Do you know what percent? you have vaccinated at this point? Are you tracking that at all? I'm sorry, what, 80? 86%, 86 that's wonderful. That's based on the responses you received, let me say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So a percentage of people who've responded is what. Ah, okay. All right. So, um, okay. Um, and then, um, Phil, my understanding with the budgeting, so there are a lot of things that you've included in here, uh, like new positions um, and uniforms and things that we will live with for uh, future years. But because we have the opportunity to use ESSER funds this year, we can free up the money in the traditional budget for other things. And so next year when we, or the year after, when we don't have ESSER funds, the shift back to our budget 
and we don't have the investments that we're going to be making this year because we have the flexibility to do that, right? Absolutely. We're yeah. Through the regular budget process, and we decide what we look at our return on investment, decide what is we're going to be keeping and what is going to be moving on. And every year we go through that work. Yeah, and and so there are things that are included in the ESSER fund list that will be um, a, an ongoing expense for us, but we know that in those future years, we won't be spending other money on, oh, additional equipment for classrooms mm -hmm. or other things that are one-time expenses this year. So it, it shifts in that way. So, you know, I, I think there've been a little bit of, um, uh, I guess, con questions or confusion over, well, how are we gonna pay for this in the future? And uh, from what I've seen and how you uh, shift the priorities in the budget, you you will make that happen. Absolutely. Okay. No, that's that's all I have. Thank you. My, my question is a good answer. Yeah, Mr. Jones, back to you. Yeah, just a uh, uh, a couple things, uh, and this is just for my clarification and understanding, because I, I agree with uh, Sheila. Just uh, the, the the formatting, the structure is not something that when you look at a normal. Uh, income expense statement kind of kind of thing. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, what are the uh, sub uh, accounts under instruction support services and then non non instructional support? I mean what 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 accomplishes those those lines? Yeah the if you look at that uh, page under budget summary you see it's the tab right after the budget message. That's the, it looks like this. This is the page that we, that we use, right. I, I present to the board each month. And as we look at uh, the top section under instruction, so it's, we group it by, or actually the, uh, the board advised my predecessor or his predecessor's predecessor to group things by function rather than by object. There's other districts who group things by object, which is another way to kind of slice and dice your budget, but this is by function. And it's elementary, which is one through eight, senior, high, and alternative. That's that's basically the listing of all the instructional spaces. Okay, that, that, that hold up this question. That's that's what I would have thought, but the numbers don't add up. Let's say more about that. Uh, well, like for example, I think uh, elementary is we, we're proposing twelve million, and then um, the senior high is let's call it thirteen and eight. I think it's 21. I'm just rounding up just for purposes of arithmetic. And then on um, something else, when I'm, and I'm getting a little lost here, it seemed that the the number for uh, instructional support is something like 23 million. So what I'm saying is they, they don't, they're not off by a lot, but, but when you take a what you think would be the categories that make that up and you look at these two and then you go to this other category that you got and, and you see these not big discrepancies but it makes you wonder well what am i missing or what's what's okay yeah it is I, I to say it back to you i think sometimes the numbers that are exactly on here uh, may be a little bit different than the numbers. And that's, that what, yeah, and, that, and that's kind of what I, and, and that's what I'm yeah. saying. And since I don't know the chart of accounts, I'm now trying to figure out sure, sure. Uh, how this is aligned with that. that was, that's what kind of made me ask, ask the question. Yeah, I work on tightening that up. A lot of times it's, it's estimates and it's estimates and rounded to the nearest hundred thousand dollars or the nearest ten thousand dollars. And uh, the rounding could be a rounding difference as well. Well, that's why I rounded up. The, the 12, the 12, 7, the 13 and stuff like that. So I'm not really concerned about uh, around it. I'm just saying if, if, if it looks like it's a $2 million difference between one category that I would think was instruction and then another category. And I'm, I'm trying to get exactly which one it is. Yeah, I'm happy to, I mean, actually, this is where most of my work happens in, in my in my life. Not in my life, but I, I, would, love, I would love to. <laughs> I would love to, you, should, you can ask the NEA about it. They're, they're sick okay. of looking at this uh, from the uh, IPB agreement team. But um, I'm, I'm really ha would be happy to have a budget workshop, uh, even with the public and with others. And we can kind of drill down into how all this works. 
Um, and just another question, and this, this is yes or no. Do we, are we able to capture uh, instructional expense and support services uh, at the building level? I mean, if we want to slice that so we could say, okay, the, because I assume support services is a building related expense, right? Almost always. I mean, that's what I'm talking about, by and large. I'm not talking about 100%, but by and large. Yeah, by it's, and it's, large. It's building related, building related and, and obviously instruction is building related. So yeah. we got an idea of uh, if, if, uh, if you say the buildings are the unit of production, we got an idea of what it costs to uh, at each building that we're operating. Usually in January, February, uh, about mid year, I'll give the board an update on uh, cost per building and cost okay. per student per building broken down uh, okay. with that data. Yeah. But thanks yeah, for the question. Uh, I, I only had really two questions. I guess one, I know we've been talking a lot about anticipated student attendance for the next school year. Uh, at what point will we start to look at what those projections are? Because I know that ADA is going to drive a lot of the numbers in the budget. And because I know that, you know, COVID was one of those anomalies where you know, it probably happens once in a lifetime. But I guess in my thinking, I'm saying if, if we don't do anything, but go back and look at, you know, our attendance at 2018, 20, well, 2017, 18, 19, to get a sense of what that trend would look like, because at some point we've got to put a number to attendance. And that's part of the reason why last month I was asking a question of let's let's get a sense of what attendance looks like at the map testing because it's kind of a microcosm of what attendance could be across the district. If we see that attendance is robust doing testing, then we could extrapolate and say it looks like you know we're going to have a good show when, when we get ready to go back to school. So I think uh, going forward, we need to really start putting those attendance numbers in front of us to see how that's going to uh, is, is going to inform the budget process. The other thing I had a question about is as I look at the, uh, the, the, conf the information that you had indicated, I know that there is a reduction in school uh, classroom size at first grade and seven and eight because of the, cr the critical nature of those grades. But I guess the one question I'm concerned about coming through COVID from a virtual environment, what other things are budgeted for student support? Because as I look through here, other than those things you just communicated, I'm trying to find out how else are we going to, because we already had some students that were based on the already that were one, two, and three years behind. So what does budget support look like for those kids coming forward into the, this new school year? What are we doing to help them? Well, most of our recurring expenses for curriculum instruction and at the building level is continuing to invite uh, folks who are over. Yeah. Um, a couple of things. We saw in a couple of grade levels class sizes swelling up to about 26 kids in the room. And that was just incongruent with the kind of differentiated support we know our kids are going to need. We lowered those class sizes and put some teachers back in the space such that we can get that down closer to 2022 uh, kids in the room. Relative to this question of how we're going to do support, whether that's academic support or social emotional support, that, that comes down to <clears throat> how we orient ourselves in our extended day programs, what are we doing after school with kids, uh, and how do we extend the school year for kids. And so you should expect a, a complete overhaul of our summer school approach for 2022 as we attempt to identify what kids need and then get them that support uh, beyond the school day. Now, when, when you talk about the extended school day, extended school week, have we started those parent conversations yet? Because uh, those, are, those are going to be long overdue because parents are going to determine how successful that's going to be. So uh, I, I would suggest that we start sooner rather than later with those conversations. Mm -hmm. Uh, other than that, I don't have any other things from the, uh, there's a couple of other ancillary things that I had, uh, but I can, I can take care of those later. But I guess at this point, we have a motion and a second. Will you, yes, just, sir. Just, just one question. Uh, uh, and and I kind of put the context of it like this. I had a, a good friend that served a long time in the state legislature, the late Fred Williams. And Fred had this famous saying in, in the house, when somebody gave him a bill and he said, you know, that's the read it. He said, yeah, I read it. So I know what it says, but what does it do? And so the budget presentation is like, well, what, these are the numbers. But I'm interested from the superintendent, 
what does the budget do? I mean, because as you always say, William, the budget is just a policy document. It's, it's an organizational vision in numerical right. form. Right. And so my, my question is, what is this budget designed to get done educationally in 21, school year 21-22? Yep. It, articulated to our strategic plan, it does, uh, first and foremost, start to build the systems around rigor that we need for our kids. So once upon a time curriculum implementation was merely <laughs> subscribe to a particular um, publisher, they send you out a box, you start chapter one and you keep it moving. And it was really predicated upon teachers being able to figure it out. Our curriculum approach is really PD heavy because not only is there rigorous content, but really the teachers need help and support in figuring out how to deliver that rigorous content. And so what you see reflected in this budget is a continuation of our literacy shift uh, from what we were doing that wasn't working, that was getting us to 15% proficiency, to expeditionary learning, which is starting to show some growth in our reading. We'll follow on with a KA adoption in mathematics and teachers will need similar support relative to the deployment of that new, more rigorous what, what would that look, uh, Just an example, what does that look like for the teacher in the classroom since you, because I'm taking away from what you just said, yeah. there'll be heavy emphasis on support for the teacher who That's has right. to do heavier lifting in, in right. this system. So what does that look like? So they get a, a group of materials. In August, they'll get support from somebody on the East Coast to help them understand sort of the framework for delivery. Then on an ongoing basis, they'll get support from these other instructional folks in the development of their assessments and in their ongoing internalization of that more complicated instructional work. And so they are surrounded by both consultants from the East Coast with from the publisher and also people locally who can on an ongoing basis because we have professional development every week in our buildings oh, those, help those, those staff support. people that would be okay now our hope is down the road we won't continue to need to deploy people from central office to support the schools and so the union rightly so is concerned that the longer you stay in the school district the less we incentivize you to grow economically and so what we've talked about is how do we create career paths for our more experienced teachers to grow into these academic support roles as part of their teaching. And so I'm hopeful in the next 12 to 24 months, we can build out a continuation of master teacher status that takes over that work and diffuses it across our buildings as opposed to having these standalone support structures in literacy and mathematics. Any other questions? Mm, not, not today. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, you know, one, one of the things, I guess, as you talk about the, the heavy PD uh, going into uh, next school year, I know that, that PD has two components to it. It has the implementation piece, because I know that teachers have been doing the three weeks on in the front end of the school year, and then they're doing the what, half day PD on Fridays. So I guess, at what point does all of that PD work shift from, uh, from implementation into student mastery of the actual work? At what point do you anticipate that shift occurring? Because I know there's been a lot of focus around implementation. I'm just trying to figure out well, when does that implementation drive itself into student mastery? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a little bit of that right now, right? In terms of a how we create um, the instructional materials to, for them to deliver as well as the assessments. It all kind of centers on student work as the linchpin of that. But I think we're probably 12 to 24 months before we have enough capacity in our district where the, the conversations are exclusively about student performance and not about adult learning. Right now, the adults are on changeover. And so once we move the adult into a different level of competency and proficiency, then we can be exclusively focused on student performance. Okay. Yeah, because I know one of the things we talked about is at some point, uh, the, the entire professional development plan 
which I know is one of the board governing documents. I'm sure the board would be interested in seeing that comprehensive document and how it all comes together. Because I don't know, have you actually looked at the professional development plan at any point? I'm not sure. I see a no. So at some point, I think it would be helpful for that to come forward. Uh, I guess two things to happen with the professional development plan. One, that it would come forward so we could see what the comprehensive look is. But also I think it's equally as important to get feedback from teachers around how they felt about the implementation of what they've been engaging in. Because you wanna make sure that not only uh, is it what you wanna do, but you wanna make sure that it's beneficial to the individuals that are re receiving that support. Uh, with that being said, I don't have any other comments. Uh, I know we have a motion and a second uh, to approve the budget uh, for the 2021 school year. Is there any other discussion? If there's no other discussion, uh, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone contrary? Okay, the 2021 uh, school district budget has been approved. The 22, sorry about that, 21, 22. I'm reading too quickly for my own benefit. Uh, the next item we have is 7.03, approve the change order for the culinary arts classroom. Okay, who, who do we have on deck for that? Superintendent. Okay, superintendent on deck. Um, as you might know, our culinary arts program is uh, one of our most successful and one of our most popular. Um, which is a bit of a change. A number of uh, family and consumer sciences programs have walked back their programs in exchange for other priorities. And we have a very strong, I think, family and consumer sciences um, offering at Normandy High School. As we were contemplating the um, renovation of West, the initial diagrams showed um, updating the space as it, as it laid out uh, currently. Um, and that was one price. The difficulty for me, um, and hats off to uh, Chef O'Bannon because she's prepared to cook wherever. We give her a grill and some hallway space. She's gonna cook with the kids. But the difficulty for me was there was this shotgun part in uh, our, we have two uh, culinary arts classrooms. One is sort of a traditional home ec room that we might remember from our days in school. And the other one is a more professional space where we're training kids for uh, a modern restaurant. Well, they had a shotgun hood, it's a huge hood, um, where most of the equipment um, was sitting under. And in my mind, that's all kind of safety issues around kids being congested in one space, their air quality issues, et cetera. And so instead of repeating that mistake, um, as we look to grow this program, and we spent a lot of time talking about food science, food service, food fragility within the context of our community, then we need to do it right. So we came back to the table with Chef O'Bannon and said, what would it take for kids to leave Normandy High School and be able to walk into any restaurant in the city and know where they're supposed to go, know how to use all the equipment? That recommended a different layout with five stations at the walls um, with uh, the ability to do the kind of cooking that you would see in a modern restaurant um, as well as have some other baking materials that we didn't have. When we started to look at that, that meant an additional $255,000 in construction. Uh, we've got to do roof cuts to get those new fuel hoods in because we need now five new fuel hoods to make that work. It also meant $190,000 in new equipment, uh, which we were able to um, charge to uh, SO2 funds. And so I'm here tonight to ask uh, you for a change order to update our culinary art space to the type of space that is safer and um, more vibrant for our kids. When this is done, I assure you that our students will be able to not only train for a modern restaurant, but in fact, they should be able to launch their own uh, catering business um, as a consequence of how this new space will lay out. Okay, that was too easy. <laughs> when is your presentation over? Okay, okay, we got we got a motion. Can I get a second? Second. It's been properly moved and second that the approved change order for culinary arts. If I did my math right, that's four hundred and forty-five thousand dollars. Is that correct? It's total, but from different revenue sources. Okay, uh, so. 
and I know that 190 of it is for equipment, and then the other 255 was for the other assorted costs. So 445 in total. So we got a motion. We got a second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, anybody contrary? All right, uh, that's been approved. Uh, next item on the agenda, we got the attendance presentation, which is 8.01, and uh, which is an item for. If, uh, 704. Oh. Uh, oh, 704, right. That was, uh, okay, that was the calendar. Sorry about that. Uh, 7.04, which is the JEGB meeting schedule for 2021-22. Uh, so we, we now have that item. And I know, Sarah, it was uh, at your request that we moved it to that particular space. So if you could share with us what your thinking is, we can kind of move forward from there. Uh, we uh, discussed uh, previously in um, an executive session, I believe, uh, made the suggestion to move from Monday evening uh, board meeting dates to something later in the week, whether it's Tuesday or Wednesday. We talked about Tuesday. I'm absolutely open to whatever date it would be, but we found that over the course of the year, we put undue, um, uh, I, I'd say stress on the staff and the board as the, the meeting materials come in on a Friday, questions, we're, we are peppering the staff all weekend long uh, with those questions that if we had another working day in the week prior, immediately prior to the board meeting, it'd be helpful for all involved. So just suggesting that moves from a Monday to uh, a date later in the week. Okay, and I think one of the things that's vitally important is, uh, you know, we have a, we're planning for a board retreat, I believe we're in the month of August now, and one of the things we're going to look at is we're going to take a look at some board operational things in terms of how we do business, and some of that's going to be impacted in terms of how information flows into board meetings and how we react to it. So we're going to take a very intentional look at, at how we go about doing our work. Um, at this point, uh, we have uh, a suggestion to go to Tuesday meetings as opposed to Monday. Uh, can I get a motion to support that idea? I okay, we got a motion. I need a motion first. I'll I'll second. Motion. Oh. Oh. Okay, no, motion. 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 You second it. Has the motion. Uh, Karen Pierre has the second. Uh, any other discussion on that particular item? Anything else? Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, anybody contrary? All right. So we'll. We'll be able to take that calendar. We'll we'll go back and address it to make sure that we get the appropriate Tuesday dates, and then we'll come forward. You know, once that's been amended. Uh, at this point, we're at eight point zero one. If I'm in, at the correct place in the agenda, which is the attendance attendance presentation, which is an item for information. Okay. Just before she continues, I, we are we are saying second Tuesday. Is that what we're looking to do? Moving it to second Tuesdays? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, I'm going to try to go. Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay, there we go. Nope. Am I good now? Okay. They have me muted. No. Yeah, You're good. Okay. I'm sorry for this. Oops. My camera's off now. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Okay, but I go back to my PowerPoint, right? Okay. I knew that. Okay, we're way down here. Um, our objectives are to reduce chronic absence by 10% for every student in our schools, ensure that 90% of our students attend school 90% of the days annually. We reach an average daily attendance, the ADA, ADA rate of 90% at every school, and that each student participates in 10, uh, 1,040 hours of instruction as required by the state. Is it? I think it's me. It skipped. Okay. There we go. Yes, that's correct. In your strategic plan and priority four, um, there was a list for impactful partnerships, strength in families and community partnerships through tighter coordination and alignment in those strategic um, priorities. We were to, to design and launch attendance incentives and intervention programming, develop and launch a systematic approach to effectively realign volunteers, partners, and support students attending academic needs. And so that was what our goal, that's what our, okay, it's, we're behind on my screen. That's what it is. I got it now. I know what I'm doing now. Okay, <laughs> so there we are. The next point was, you know, what was the process? What were the tasks that we needed to do to make that happen? So one of the first things I did when I started was create a task force. In that task force, there was a principal, attendance clerk, social workers, um, counselors, a fail. We have an internal fail as well as the fails that we have with Beyond Housing that work in our individual schools. And we found in, in this approach, in this task force, that there were a lot of inaccuracies in the way that we were um, taking attendance, that transportation challenges were issued between the safety of kids working school, walking to school as well as where they were catching the bus at. There was also some challenges from um, the fact that we didn't have a systematic uh, process to the way we uh, held attendance. So there was no way to hold everybody accountable in the way that we were doing attendance. On top of that, outside organizations were being held accountable for our attendance. And so these are some of the things this task force found out in that process. So we got together and we started talking about what's the design look like of an attendance plan, the intent of incentives and an intervention plan that we made sure that there were incentives in place, that there will be incentives in place for our kids to do well, but also the kids that we want to do better, we will focus on them as well. 
The other part was the attendance procedure manual, which I'll talk about a little later, is making sure that our school district as a whole understands that attendance matters. And that's going to be our, our theme this year. Attendance matters. Every part of attendance matters. Then we developed and implemented a monitoring system for the, our, these attendance issues that I think most of you saw in your board docs, the draft of that first document. And then assessing, making sure that we assess this plan and be and, and create revisions for the next school year. We're going to immediately stop, have some stop gaps in here where we're like, this is working, this isn't working. Let's make sure we're prepared for the next school year. Process. We use data from the task force to create the procedural manual that you received. We strategically target most schools that are at risk for increased attendance. We had some schools that had some real challenges, not only with the amount of kids that came to school that had challenges with attendance, but also with the way they provided attendance, the way they tracked attendance, the way they did attendance in those schools. Um, we also identify partners um, to support interventions. One of the things that you ask for in the strategic plan is that what do our partners look like um, that are helping us support, uh, support attendance? and to provide training to key staff. We're doing a four day training with all attendance clerks, as well as we'll do an extensive training with our teachers about the way we utilize CISK 12 with our students so that our teachers are held accountable, that, that teaching, that the attendance is in every day at a certain time. And from my understanding, if I'm correct, they're even gonna be held accountable to make sure that it's in by a different time every day. Uh, and then assess the implementations, make more, again, there's always going to be an opportunity for revisions. This isn't um, the gospel. <laughs> We're going to make some changes to make sure that it gets better as time goes on. So you got to receive, you received the attendance procedure manual. And the reason we talked about pre procedure is because it's a process. We want them to understand there are steps that has to be taken for every student in order to get the pot, to promote the positive and accurate attendance plan. Um, then also with this manual, by the way, um, the task force between the, the task work of the task force data collecting, we reached out to similar school districts here in Missouri that had some of the same issues, as well as we looked at a plan in Oakland, Detroit, and New York, who also had challenging um, attendance issues around the country. And as well, we've created this manual to identify how schools are going to promote positive um, attendance moving forward. The other thing was to make sure that staff knew and understand it by putting into practice procedures that were consistent with the state. The state has a process of how they want attendance done. We needed to make sure that our schools are follow us, following those procedures and policies as well. So no, number the first thing about this, there's four components of this plan. We wanted to recognize the students who have improved attendance or recognized by their school. And this manual offers suggestions on how we can provide recognition to the students. We want to engage parents and students on the importance of attendance. So September is National Attendance Matters uh, Month. And so we will kick off a campaign with parents, with the community, with the mayors, with the 24-1, with everyone talking about how important attendance is in, um, in the country, but in particular in Normandy. Then we're going to, who manages this? And, and I think uh, Phil kind of talked about, you saw art on the budget. So we're creating attendance response team, the art teams. There'll be an art team at every school that will implement the plan that we're discussing. And then early outreach. Processes need to be in place from the beginning of the school, th school year, throughout the year, to identify students at um, high risk for chronic absences and how they'll be supported. And I thought this was funny, a little bit. The attendance manual will do a couple of three things in particular. It's a universal preventive programs, programs that are and strategies designed for the entire school. Intervention, target those students identified as high risk for chronic absence and recovery programs designed to support students who continue to have attendance challenges despite implement, implemented um, interventions. The team itself, Uh, the team itself is a site team. It's a site team of that will include an attendance clerk, family liaison, counselor, social worker, principal, and myself. I will be on each site team 
um, each art team to make sure that we are following the process throughout. It'll be a lot of reporting back weekly. We'll have weekly meetings with this team, bi-weekly when we're dealing with attendance with a student. If we have students that have been targeted, that there's some issues, we'll be meeting with them regularly. There'll be referrals. Um, uh, referrals for screen and resolution for individual students in regular pattern with has that have irregular patterns of attendance and seek to actively involve parents in resolving that issue. The art team brings a, a strength based approach that provides a setting where all participants work together to identify strategies that will improve the students attendance. Addressing the need of the whole child and individual root causes of the issues at hand. <laughs> it's going so well. So the goals, what are the goals of the art team? Promote a culture and practice of positive attendance in our schools. Implement intervention strategies um, to interrupt negative attendance patterns and reduce chronic absenteeism. Provide support to habitually truant students and their families through attendance through the art team process. Conduct our team um, hearings and reviews with different families and which different groups that are culturally sensitive to the student and the family's conditions. I think that's really important that we think about that we are going to be culturally sensitive to the challenges of that family and by, ha by having so many different partners and having so many different organizations involved, it would allow us to address the needs of that parent of that family. Um, as they need. And then support the district and school staff by training them on how to develop strategies to create the necessary conditions to support positive school attendance. This is kind of something I want to share with you for the team is that there's a cycle of inquiry. We identify the student, analyze the data, share the results, generate <clears throat> solutions, data set for target improvements, try out the interventions to see if they're working and assess what worked and what didn't. A lot of assessment is gonna be required in this plan back to the situation because we need to make sure it works. And it has to happen throughout the year. It, we cannot wait to the end of the year to say, did this plan work? We have to address it on a regular basis. So for the sake of time, um, these are some of the attendant support by identifying, we're gonna promote the culture of positive, um, intervention, excuse me, I'm sorry, I skipped there. Back to one of the other things that were in the strategic plan, it was about um, us looking at key partners to, um, to make sure they support the implementation of our attendance plan. We also wanted partnerships focused on attendance and partnerships adjustments by school year 2022-23 based on the results of the evaluation. But you guys had the forethought of that. You already had that in the strategic plan. So that was easy for us to put into this plan to make sure that it works in our plan. And finally, one of my favorite people um, in the world said positive school climates not only minimize unnecessary suspensions and expulsion, but it also reduces the disorder of classroom and bolster learning. Because if they're not there, <laughs> we can't do these things. So Arnie Duncan was one of my favorites. And so I left off the US part, but uh, he was fantastic with our education process. So any questions? I say since attendance is foundational to the operation and it's got to happen every place every day, how could we not have a common uh, system or comprehensive system in every place, that, you know, uh, that does it the same way, even if they don't do it well, okay? But I mean, if we're doing it, everybody's doing the same thing every day and you know, some days we're great at it, some days we're not. I get uh, that, but for the life of me, I cannot understand how it don't, it didn't exist. Um, two fold answer. One, um, we and staff for accountability to Regina's point, 
in some places we had effectively outsourced uh, responsibility for attendance mm -hmm. to uh, family engagement liaisons work directly for the yeah, housing. There was no unanimity of practice relative uh, to how we were taking attendance, even across the elementals, they're all on the same level. You should take third grade attendance the same way from building to from building. building. But the second but the issue, second issue is, is, is we didn't have those systems, systems for anything else, anything else. Not, even not, even not even the teaching and literacy. literacy. So we yeah, had the, so same, we had the same, same content. content. We had three we different professional development approaches to teaching and reading in our district. Multiple approaches to reading and reading in our district. And so one of the things that we've been working on over the last year is how to systematize our practice such that we can actually hold people accountable because we know how it should be done versus from building to building people inventing practice. And so hats off to uh, Dr. Deidre Taylor and folks at Obama because they had fairly solid this, uh, attendance practices mm -hmm. that I think uh, Regina and her team were able to to build off of as they put together this 28-page uh, uh, procedure manual. Right. But before now, people were taking attendance like they wanted to take attendance. And poor uh, Christine Bonds in Central Office, who works the um, student information system, was trying to make heads and tails of it. And one of the things that we found out as we audited the system, because the data was inconsistent, was the problem wasn't the system was problematic or the person managing the system, it was the inputs were there. And so until we got to some type of systematic approach, then we couldn't effectively manage our data. You look like you have a question. Yeah, I mean, that, I heard what you said, but I still don't understand how you have a complete breakdown and collapse of something as foundational as, you mean, you know, they've been lining up little children and taking attendance the first thing you do when you sit, when you sit your butt in the seat every day. I mean, you know, uh, so, and if we can't get attendance right, you know, that means you, I would have to say by extension, you're not getting anything right. But I think that's exactly what, what, what we're talking about. We have to rebuild systems in places where you would have thought those systems would be on autopilot, right? And so right. I don't think you didn't have to think about that, right? So the mistake I made coming into the work was assuming that those foundational systems were intact, and the thing we were working on was the higher order thinking skills, how to get to more rigorous instruction, and how to get better teaching. Well, you can't get to that if you can't take attendance, if you can't do standard personnel correctly, if you can't do um, some of your other standard operational procedures the right way. Okay. So a lot of the work, I mean, we're seeing this in attendance, but, but this is the story over and over again across our district. A lot of the work has been, how do we bring folks together and get them on the same page, one band, one set? And Mike, I would, I would tell you that I'll go back two years and the board had the same discussion and we pushed for a very specific system and to get it right. I mean, so this was prior to the pandemic year. Well, so I don't know. I, 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 everybody gets a break for the pandemic. Yeah, so well, no, yeah. no, 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 this was, uh, gosh, Sheila, uh, the board was, uh, it, it, yeah, and, and then, uh, I mean, one of my questions is all about the, we've asked about this, for this before, we've asked for accountability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so what are the accountability tactics? I also struggle with a 28-page procedure manual. I'm sure it's detailed, but how do you put that into practice every day so that people remember a 28-page procedure manual? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then who is ultimately accountable? I is know. it you are? Yes. Uh, the superintendent is. But we have. This has been one of those things, and and I mean. I was watching your face as you asked this question, and that face has been, uh, it's been a similar face over the years. So it's, I get it. Right. So I, I was smiling at that, not at, <laughs> and, and we've got to, uh, from day one with this new school year, be on it and, and, and have a report daily. I mean, there's got to be something that, that reassures us very early on. I know you said weekly meetings, but this this just has to be something that we all hear about all the time when the school year starts. 
I agree. And it's almost kind of working backwards if I go back to even enrollment. So right now we have an intern that's calling every yeah. oh, family yeah. to see if they're coming back to Normandy. Then in July, we'll reach out to the families and knock on doors of those we haven't received. And in, at the end of July, we'll start talking about attendance matters with families. It right. can't be when they walk in the door. We'll start talking about when they don't walk in the door. They are on the hopefully on the website, really pushing attendance. It can't be yeah. um, the day they arrive. We have to make sure make sure that this is across the board. What we believe and what we're going to find. Mm -hmm. Also, also on the side of the train, this will this will get down, down, down to into a play, a play by play. So, so there will be then again each school has a team of folks that will empower with this information so they will be able to follow it. There's even documents in there. There are templates now that are district-wide mm -hmm. that they have templates of the documents that they will use at different steps for the parents. So it won't be, I'll send this or I'll send this or the principal will even have to rewrite a letter. They're already done. The team knows that. We'll also receive, I think what I found a gap already in is that we were receiving, I was receiving reports on a monthly um, about when a child was missing as opposed to weekly. So now it needs to be cumulative over the weeks. So I see if that child missed this day and missed the day next week, that's, that's a, a red flag. And so we, we jump on it immediately. So all of that kind of micromanaging through the process is going to be required in order to make this plan successful. We've also been very intentional about where this work sits, which is to say, um, we didn't situate the work with the school principal. We didn't situate the work with our um, safety and security folks. This is a, a compliance function. This is a support function. And so school attendance is connected to the kind of wraparound services we provide our district. If the art team gets to the house and discovers that the utilities are off, then they have a responsibility to try to help the family find utility systems. If this is a question of uh, transportation, if this is a question of homelessness, what Regina oversees in, in her department should bring resources to the table to help these families get through that and get that child back in school. Do you have a question? Oh, okay, Ken, you got anything? Hey, don't between both of them. I'm good. Yeah. Have you explored some of the businesses in the area? Uh, when I was a principal, I reached out to the Cardinals and at the time the Rams and movie theaters. Do you want to unmute? Do you want to unmute? They provided incentives for <laughs> students with um, perfect attendance, or you can just kind of set, uh, you know, whatever that might be for a quarter. And uh, I mean, students really got mm -hmm. into wanting to go to the Cardinals mm -hmm. baseball game, and wanting to go see the Rams play. We have a movie theater right here in our community. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why we can't have a night of Perfect attendance students going to the movie, perfect Good idea. attendance, or mm -hmm. you know, they give you tickets and mm -hmm. uh, family tickets. Love it. You Love know, it. so those are some things just to think about. And every meeting I'm in, I'm in, I ask for incentives. <laughs> every Zoom I'm on, do you have some incentives that we can put in the schools that they'll have? But that's a great idea. That's a group idea um, that I'll definitely reach out to the folks and see if that's an option. Well, you know, I think, you know, as we talk about attendance, because I know in all of the community meetings I've had an opportunity to attend, attendance has been the major conversation that I've had, because the attendance at school is not a child issue, it's an adult issue. And so we need to talk to adults about why are your children not at school. And I think because of the fact that it sounds like we had a broken system, and I think the broken system, uh, Sarah, when you first mentioned it, probably went all the way back when you all were doing an APR review and you didn't get any points in attendance. I'm sure at that point the alarm bell went off. And, and, and so generally what, what that says to me going forward, in order for us to be very intentional around attendance, uh, I would like to have monthly updates from the work that you're doing around attendance to the board so we can understand that. And in between the monthly meetings, the superintendent will be doing a weekly update. And I would ask that you would focus uh, uh, attention around how we're doing in between board meetings around attendance. Because we, if we all pay attention to attendance, we don't end the year in a space where we say, you know, we didn't get attendance points and we don't know what happened with attendance. We have to be very intentional about how we look look at it, how we talk about it, and, and what we expect to see. So um, 
those are my comments. Uh, and, and just to tack on to that, I, it's not even just about the APR points. It's about children learning. Yes, absolutely. And, and they cannot learn if they're not in school. And it is an adult issue. And and um, we've got to build those supports in uh, that, that, that we're talking about with the wraparound services. But my biggest thing here is if a kid can't come to school, I mean, that kid's not going to be at grade level. And you miss 10 days, you, you're just not going to, how do you recover from that? And so it, it's critical. I mean, beyond just even APR, I mean, pure, purely thinking about student success, this has to be improved. Well, absolutely. And one of the things that I do know, and as, as best I remember, and I know we don't want to get to that level of, of directing activities, but I know years ago, I think in each one of the 23 municipalities just about should have a parent neglect ordinance on the book. So if you get to a point where folks are just not paying attention to you at all, the, each of those communities do have some tools that they're using in their discretion. We're not saying we need to get to that level, but in fact, I think you know years ago that, that groundwork was put in place so that if you really got to a point where folks were just not paying attention to you at all, municipalities do have some additional things they could do to support getting kids into school. Because it's just that I agree, but I would say one thing just with, and we've got to be innovative. And as, and as much as it is a parent's responsibility, we have a lot of parents that are at working and these children are getting up in the morning, heading to the bus stop on their own and getting to school. So as, as much as it is a parent, I get that. We've got to encourage the children. We've got to show them the importance. We also have to have schools that they want to be in. You know, we want to That's exactly right. I was just going to say the culture that we create. Schools. Yeah. We have to have middle schools. We have to have schools that kids want to be in. They have to be wanted to be there right. as well. So I think that's where you guys and we are working to get to that point. But we've got to encourage our children as much as we encourage our parents. And we do appreciate the work that you've put into this because I know it's it's a start of a of a, of a major process. And so we do appreciate the start that you've gotten. So uh, we look forward to having the favorable results going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next item up is 8.02 construction update. Uh, it's an item for information as well. Thank you. Before I hand it over to Marcus Lumi from KAI, construction manager, just wanted to uh, point out a few things. Uh, first, you can see that Central and East Halls are still grouped together. Uh, we'll have those separated out once we get the bids coming in uh, for the board request, and we'll be patient with that, and we'll, we'll have that together. Uh, we do anticipate a special call meeting coming up in July after the uh, July regular board meeting. I uh, will be bringing to you uh, the selection of a contractor for the work at the secure contractor. So I'm going to give you a that. Um, also, you can see on board docs that there's so far there's only been two change orders, <laughs> not three change orders. Uh, and I think that is making sure the board was aware of those. And that's because you've approved all three. So there haven't been other ones yet, but I have no dispute with you on that. And this time we'll hand it over to Marcus. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So, so we'll give you a brief update on what's been happening, happening over the last month at the uh, high school campus for the Prop B projects. This is the uh, schedule that we reviewed previously, and we're still generally following the path. Um, West Hall is on the way, demolition is uh, wrapping up. New work is starting to be framed in, and new um, electrical plumbing rough ends have started. We have out there um, the Midwest Service Group. They're the abatement contractor. They're removing um, asbestos containing materials, web based paint. Um, the majority of the work in West Hall is complete. They have one more stairwell to do encapsulation on. Uh, they have moved into Central Hall now. And they are working, I'll show you some more of what they're doing with. But um, there's a small amount of work to do in Central, which is part of the West Hall project, where the new buildings connect. Um, and then there's a, a bunch of work we talked about last month that they moved into this summer. Um, 
to get ahead of the next summer's work in Central, and that's occurring now as well. So they're being very cooperative with the contractor to be able to work around each other. Uh, there's some complications with connecting the two buildings, as you can imagine. Um, there's a chimney in the way and a piping everywhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, nothing we nothing yet we know about. It's just the complications that we're trying to figure out. So this is sort of the uh, report card on Midwest. Uh, like Dr. Christieri said, there's been one change over to them so far. Uh, and then we'll divide this out next uh, month so that West Hall is separate from East Hall. But currently that $119,000, $119,950, that is actually a central hall cost. Um, that's down in the bottom half of the page there where it says revised contract amount, 281. That's basically central and uh, West combined. I'll, I'll separate that out next time so we can start to keep these the costs separate since we have the budget separate. Um, so they're, uh, West Hall, like I said, is complete central hall today. They're on schedule. They're staying ahead of uh, right construction fairly well. They are on track with their business participation. They actually have two subcontractors that are hitting exactly the 25 and 5, uh, and their boots on the ground is tracking well to their projection. They're projecting to have a 42.5% minority in the workforce, and they're currently at 41.25. So doing a very good job. Right Construction Services, they're the general contractor out there. They're the biggest contract by far on the project. Um, uh, like Dr. Bissetari said, there's there's no process change orders against Wright so far. We have one approved item, which actually shows, shows here as a credit of $14,560. It's been approved. We just haven't uh, routed the change order for it yet. It's actually uh, a correction to the bid documents. There was two ceiling tile types uh, specified. Uh, the one that the architect chose was actually the less expensive one. So Wright credited back the amount for the the higher price one, which was included in the bid. So we'll get that taken care of before our next meeting. We do not have any reporting yet on their uh, minority and boots on the ground, um, business and boots on the ground participation, but we should have that by next month. That comes with the pay apps. So the pay app cycles are a little bit out of sequence with your board meetings. So we may always be at least a half a month out. Here's some um, existing pictures of what's going on at uh, West Hall right now. This is the uh, section of the building that will be the new um, fashion design studios. If you recall this area, it was actually, uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was daycare, it was younger children spaces. Uh, now it's all been opened up. This is all cleaned up now, ready to be renovated into the new uses. This is the cafeteria. If you were in there prior, you'll probably uh, see it's drastically different than it was before. The entire ceiling is out. Uh, they're using this for a staging area. Next picture is probably also a little bit shocking. This was the kitchen. <laughs> now gone. Um, the floor is cut up now for the new plumbing. All those walk-in refrigerator freezers are gone. All the old equipment and hoods are gone uh, due, to replay, due, due to be replaced. This is the new connector to uh, Central Hall. As you can see, they removed a large portion of the floor. This will be where a series of connections go into Central Hall. To make sure that all the levels are accessible and the buildings flow together. Upcoming pending contracts. Um, now that you have approved moving forward with all the arts classroom, we will be uh, processing the contracts for um, different food service equipment to go in that space. Uh, we'll resolve that fairly quickly and get that on order. Uh, it is a long lead item. The other item we approved last month was the furniture contract. We're on track to. Uh, get that furniture for the start of school. We do have one pending change order with them uh, for some booths in the cafeteria that we're currently reviewing. Um, we've gone back and forth a couple times to find a very durable material for those, um, trying to keep that cafe comfortable, good variety of seating, but also make it um, durable and give it some longevity. So uh, new space won't actually be on site until in August, but uh, we are tracking the contract. Belter Food Service is another one that was approved last month. This is the food service equipment that the uh, district is providing, um, largely up in the culinary classrooms. Um, and that is uh, the POs for those are being executed now. Uh, Ford is involved in that as well. A small portion of uh, the equipment is being purchased through Ford. So Central, we talked about briefly, uh, a summer abatement is underway. Um, that is our head start for future work in Central next summer. Uh, so the school will be back in after we uh, get done with the abatement. 
we are also, uh, so here's the sections of the building uh, highlighted in red that are under abatement for central. So it's a vast majority of the hallway on the second and third level and the classrooms on the south side of the building. So the uh, district staff did a good job of moving basically everything across the hall. The work area is all opened up now. Uh, we have the whole building and uh, um, Ms. Douglas is uh, completely out of the building. They've relocated to East Hall for the summer and we'll give them the space back just as soon as we can. Secure connector is um, into design. Uh, we received a 95% design submittal uh, last week. We are in the bidding window. We've advertised it both in the Post-Dispatch and the St. Louis American. We have the bid announcement posted on your website. Um, and we're moving forward with the pre-bid meeting a week from Wednesday. One item there that um, we need to still do with the school is the coordination of construction phasing. Uh, we have a lot of work to do with just logistics, how the buses will come and go, uh, how much staging area we can give the contractor, um, timing of taking utilities out and replacing utilities. There's a lot of items that run through our work area that need to be uh, well considered. Um, and Dr. Stockman and Ms. Douglas have been very helpful. So the connector, uh, you'll see it on the top there, that schedule, uh, June, July, obviously, is the end of design and the start of bidding. Like I said, we are, we are in the thick of getting this thing out on the street and reviewing the final documents. This is a more detailed schedule of what we're up against right now. We're 95% review uh, of the drawings. We've um, got an outreach and partnering meeting for Wednesday. We're going to hold that virtually just to uh, encourage as many people to attend and also to you know, be respectful of people's um, comfort level with gathering. Uh, we hope we get it well attended. We've sent it out to our entire sub supplier database. We've um, got it through a number of other folks as well. We're reaching out with um, Regina Marsh and her team to try to get it into the community's hands, uh, just so people know that we're we're doing it. And this will be the opportunity for us to tell the uh, the subs and suppliers about the bond program in general. What projects are coming out? What the projects consist of generally? What your schedule is? How to find us? You know, where are we going to bid this thing? Where the where the bid documents will be located so they can get a free look at this stuff without having you know, to go buy a set for, you know, hundreds of dollars. We want to make sure it's accessible and people know how to find us. Um, also, it's an opportunity to start partnering folks together. We want to explain the minority business um, expectations and the boots on the ground expectations, just so people understand that we're serious about it and that we want them to consider it carefully. Um, so this is a chance for people to say, okay, that's kind of my scope of work. Um, I can pair up. I see somebody else in this meeting. We can help them connect, uh, maybe go after it together. Um, it's also a good opportunity to explain to people, particularly the general contractors, what the requirements are to bid. Bid bonds, performance payment bonds, uh, schedule demands, uh, expectations for coordinating work, uh, particularly since we'll be in an active school campus. Uh, the next items that come up after that are our pre-bid meeting. Like I said, that's a week from Wednesday. We'll get the documents out into the plan rooms. Um, the bidding period is, uh, goes till mid-July. I've got on here the last addendum date. That's really the last chance to get any new work into the addendum or into the documents for bidding. Uh, last few last changes from our design team. And then we'll have the opening. Uh, the schedule cut off here to make it fair enough to, to um, read, but that's uh, mid-July, we'll do the bid opening. Like Dr. Pusateri said, then we that falls in between your board meetings. So we're gonna ask for a special call board meeting at that time. Um, Talked a little bit about some of the outreach opportunities that we're working on with Virginia Marsh's team. Um, the outreach meeting I mentioned before, that's coming up on Wednesday, just to let people know what we're up to. Beyond the backpack event and um, the future community events that were spoken about earlier, um, the block parties with the mayors, uh, we want to be involved in that. So I've got my team coordinating with uh, Virginia Marsh's team and just finding ways to get engaged. We really would like to participate in a level where um, we're there, we can talk about the bond program, we can talk about uh, career pathways to construction or design careers. Um, talked about having one of our trucks shined up and clean and put a cooler in the back of juice boxes or school supplies and pencils, you know, somehow be there engaging with um, people, their parents, their kids, um, and get them excited about what we're doing in general and also about construction careers. It benefits us all uh, to be able to have these um, folks, parents or kids, find ways into the trades. It's just, we're seeing a lot of, we're seeing a drop in the, uh, participation in the trades. Uh, the people are harder to find the skill trades. So, you know, if, if we can generate any kind of interest at all and they're well-paying careers, it'd be nice to have them. So 
Uh, and now that we have a connection with uh, some directly with some sub and subcontractors, we'll try to get them there with us. That's all I had. Kept it kind of brief. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay, any questions, Mike? Sheila? Uh, is there a justice in these halls? I haven't seen the report, um, but I assume since the age of the building, I would say yes. Yeah, and so I was wondering. Okay. I would suspect it. And yes. we couldn't get that done to this summer, maybe? Well, well we had to have somewhere to put summer school, so they're in East oh, Hall. Okay. All right. Uh, um, Squeezed them down pretty tight. So we couldn't put them on high school. Okay. Once we get in East Hall, we'll have a better understanding on how much extra money there will be for the West End expansion. But that, I believe, is one of the main things that we're waiting on before we decide that we could need a whole lot of money to get in there and take it. It is all one of the worst ones. Yeah, and I'm love your willingness to participate in the in the block board i think that'll be fabulous um and i i enjoyed your presentation i love the Thank pictures you. i love that you're the the way you're presenting this information it's clear concise uh, there's enthusiasm in your voice and your presence so i, I thank you for that you're welcome karen you got any questions I just really have a comment. Yes, thank you for everything and uh, and being concise on this. So I'm looking at all of these pictures, and I think I had asked earlier, Phil, about this. Uh, you're saying 18 percent right now at this moment completed. That would be a, comp a compilation of all the contracts today, right? Yeah. yeah. Obviously, rights use that pretty heavily because their contract is so large. But you feel um, that that you are on track. Yes. Uh, a couple of the classrooms now, given the change to the culinary arts, will be late. And we've talked to Chef O'Bannon and others about how to accommodate that. So mm -hmm. um, we will have contingency plans to get as much of the building open as possible mm -hmm. when it happens. Well, like you said, you know, this is the one thing that, that the community is looking for, you know, some results. And that was quick. You know, I mean, we were already ready with the plan. Mm -hmm. So it's like, as soon as the bond issue passed, right. then it's like, hey, let's go. We can't, we can't wait on this. Right. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's really appreciated. You know, like you said, it just shows the community that we're not kidding. This is what we wanted. You know, this is what the kids need. Uh, the community right. needs that just as much. So. It's a great opportunity to get out for them this summer and, yeah. and remind them that we are working very hard in this community. Mm -hmm. that's... I appreciate it. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, just a couple of comments. I I, uh, I love seeing the pictures. I mean, we can't be over there all the time. You wouldn't want us over there all the time. <laughs> uh, but it's just so hopeful. I mean, it, uh, you look at it and, and you, you know, having walked in that building right before right. all of this started and you just think, the environment that we're creating is so powerful. Right. And, um, and I did appreciate your uh, update as well. Very concise, very to the point. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, great update. I'm wondering if we could put some of the pictures out on the website so that it's open to the community to kind of see some of the progress. Yeah, I can work with the team to get those out there. In fact, I think there are two. Okay. Okay. Nice. Nice. Good. Good. Thanks. I think the only comment I had, you know, is kind of going back to the West Gen expansion. Uh, as I looked at the preliminary numbers that we talked about earlier, I know we had 2.6 in bond issue. We picked up an additional $3 million through the investment to 2.9. And I know that the last time I looked at the numbers, uh, we were we were right at a half million dollars in contingency for each of the projects. So it looks like we got contingency covered, which means that West End expansion, based on the number that I heard of $1.88 million, that would fall comfortably within the additional three million. So it sounds like more of a reality than, than a pipe dream. What, what do you think based on what, what I'm hearing? Because the number says that there's X. Oh, this is not. Well, we're using architect's numbers. And you heard Mr. Jones say last meeting that you can take your architect friend out to lunch, but you got to know that they may not be, uh, they may be a little optimistic. So I'm not ready. I, I wouldn't recommend that we commit to it yet. Not, not for SCFO, certainly superintendent you know, could overrule that. But I say, let, let's take a look at it. You know, well, I, I'm, I'm just going on the numbers that you all put in front of us, unless those numbers are not true. 
Well, we, we're still waiting on bids. So again, we, all we have right now is the architects. I mean, he's, he's our best qualified person to make those bids based out, out of thin air, but they're still just out of thin air. Yeah, I, I was just basing it on the fact that you had you got an additional $3 million that wasn't there, and I was just trying to make sure we had a very prudent use for it. Right. I, I, just having done stuff like this, uh, <coughs> uh, I agree with you. Uh, some of my best friends are architects, and they never get the number right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, process so meeting is, is based on historical data, and I would say the yeah, background of the pandemic is, shows that the historical data is inaccurate, sometimes horribly inaccurate. So I, I would just be cautious about right. and, and being hopeful about extending the final work projects, but it's definitely still in the wrong possibility. Well, see, I, and I get it, uh, my last comment on would be this. Part of the reason for the concern is based on what I heard you say, uh, the two small gyms in East were gonna be used with the multimedia centers, and then which, which, it, which only leaves you with the weight room and the small, you got Viking Hall and the small gym next to the weight room. Mm -hmm. And I know that the two small gyms at East have been used for, for the wrestling team. So without that extra gym expansion, the question is, where are they gonna do what they do? Right. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we gotta keep it on the front burner to make sure that those, uh, I'm always concerned about the, the spaces the children live in mm -hmm. to make sure that they have what they need. So uh, that's why I'll keep bringing that up until somebody tells me the numbers won't work. But right now, the numbers I heard says that we're closer than we were before we started. I think we all know what, what you're heading for. So right. it's <laughs> understood. <laughs> yeah. So <with> that being, <laughs> we got it. <laughs> right. With that being said, we're down to uh, 9.01, which is board comments. We got any, any comments? Uh, yeah, I just got. Uh, you got to get that mute button. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I was going to say, when you're young, you'll leave a meeting saying, I wish I had said something. And then when you get old, you said, maybe I shouldn't have said that. So I'm in the old category. And I'm, Sarah, you're right. I'm still troubled by the by what the, the attendance thing represents. Not, ju not just the attendance problem, but what it's fundamentally indicative of. Mm -hmm. And uh, boards don't organize and, 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 and we don't get paid for that. And the superintendent does. But one of the things I've always thought that a school district kind of reminds me of a hospital. And a hospital has two operating functions. They have a director of medicine, a chief of the hospital, who's a doctor. And all the doctor is ever concerned with is the patients. And the doctor is in charge of everybody that touches a patient, nurses, labs, et cetera. And then there's usually a hospital administrator who's in charge of making sure the hospital functions, you know, like uh, the janitors show up, the ambulances work. I mean, all that other stuff that you got to have to have a hospital work that had nothing to do with medicine. And both of those things have to work together. And it seems to me, at least where we are, maybe we ought to think about that as an organizational model because you got these major curriculum cha challenges, student achievement challenges, which are fundamentally just like sick patients. And doctors got to be focused on that. But somebody's got to make the train run on time too, which is almost literally a second job. So I think for me, as we go into uh, the, um, the retreat in August, we, and and when I look at school systems, all of them are organized the same. They've been organized the same way for the last hundred years. I mean, fundamentally, they don't they don't they don't change functionally too much. But uh, maybe we ought to think about or at least have a conversation about what would it look like if you chopped it up and you had and you're, you're still the superintendent, but there's somebody who the only thing they worry about, worry about is instruction. 
and then there's somebody else in the building who doesn't work for whoever's in charge of ultimately instruction, but they work for somebody who's in charge of administration. And they make sure all those other things happen, whatever that is, the, cu the custodian, the grass getting cut, the, uh, the attendance being taken, literally everything that has to happen in a building that has literally nothing to do with touching a child. Huh? Yeah. That's Phil. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but 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 yeah. the, but the place is not organized like that. I mean, we we got this we got this flat organization with 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 all these functions intermingled, and I'm arguing at least considering. I'm not even arguing it. That maybe just the solution is because that way you can isolate them. That way, in a hospital, you always know what your problem is. Is your problem patient care? Okay. And you got people who do nothing but patient care, or is your or is your problem something literally with how the hospital is being run? And that's another and, and that's another place. But something nothing should like. And all I can think of is being in the fourth or fifth grade, and the first thing that happened every day is they took attendance. Cause they, and they had everybody's name in the book. And then they sent a kid down to the office with the attendance slip, okay? And if you was, if, and you held up your hand, hopefully get your chance to be out the room to go take the thing. So literally, uh, uh, it, it, yeah, but it worked. That's how, well, but it worked. I mean, yeah. and I'm talking about the middle of the last century. That's how old, that's how, but it happened every day. And it worked. So the notion that we can't take attendance not the notion that ain't nobody here. So getting kids to show up is a separate problem. I'm just focused on, we can't count them every day or we couldn't count them every day. Or no, we didn't count them every day. I didn't count, or didn't count them every day, either way. And all I'm just saying is, we need, we need to also think structurally or the other system that you said, Marcus, about an hour, four, about half hour ago, mm -hmm. and you were thinking about yeah. how water systems not working. You got all this foundational stuff that that's not here too. Yeah, and I, maybe I, and maybe the solution to that is just separate the two functions. I mean, they they literally in the same place, but in we, terms of we agree with you wholeheartedly, and I think from the outside looking in, it it makes us look top heavy. Like you got too many people who are sitting in administrative roles, but absent these systems, nobody's accountable. And so when I walked through the door and I said, tell me why attendance is so messy. Crickets, nobody has a, a viewpoint on it. Nobody's responsible for it. Tell me why it's September and we don't know how many kids are actually enrolled in this district. Crickets, nobody's responsible for it. And so I think our theory of change is in the near term, we need to staff up to build out the systems. And then once the systems are in place and the accountability is regular, then you can look at consolidation and say, through attrition, we can eliminate this position because we now have better systems to monitor these things. But until you get there, you really do need expertise on the ground, somebody who's directing it, so you can hold somebody accountable for uh, almost, that particular discrete issue. But I'm, I think I'm kind of arguing the same thing, but rather than help, but to me, it would just, like, and, and again, I'm not proposing this, but I'm just thinking it out loud. It's two people, you know, like two two Russell honorees, okay? <laughs> one, for, <laughs> one for curriculum and instruction, the other one for, for making the train run on time, okay? And, and let them figure it, I mean, let them be in charge of figuring it out okay and so and and you really take a military model that if it ain't working you don't ask the the, the enlisted personnel you ask the highest ranking officer in charge mm -hmm. and then you and then if he can't get it right or she can't get it right you get a new high ranking uh, <laughs> uh, officer in charge and you keep firing them until you find the ones that can get them and that's how lincoln won the civil war because he fired a ton of generals uh, uh, in the process of finding Sherman and Grant. Okay, and to me, that's what you're missing is Sherman and Grant. 
So, well, well, one, one, but one, well, one, just so you know, one of the conversations we have not had as a board, but that the superintendent and I have been talking about, we're going to ask you to look at your September calendar because we want to put a second date in for another retreat because we got one agenda and when we started looking at it, it became abundantly clear we didn't have enough time because part of what we were going to talk about in that second meeting is what you're discussing right now. We're li literally going to take a look at the table of organization, the way it's put together, why it's put together in support of the strategic plan. And so until, we, you know, because there's been a lot of new people added to the mix that none of us really fully understand how all those things come together and integrate. And as I said before, everything that we do must be intentional. We must understand why we do it and for what reason. And if we can't understand it, we don't do it. And so just know sometime in September, I'm going to come back out to you and say, hey, when can we get together? Because we have some very important work that we need to do. And that's going to kind of encapsulate a lot of what we're talking about. Because Superintendent and I, we've already been having those discussions about how do we get to the kind of nuance that, that Mr. Jones is talking about. But like I said, we got to sit down and have that conversation. So right now, uh, Sheila, any comments? Uh, Ms. Pierre, uh, Sarah, you got anything for me? I have anything for you. Any comments? For you? Uh, I have comments. No, for the, for the uh, okay. <laughs> well, no. Uh, general comments. Um, I, I actually, you know, there were a lot of good things in this meeting tonight. Uh, I want to comment on the iReady scores and the continued improvement in iReady. And I know that comes through a lot of hard work uh, from uh, the team in the room, uh, Crystal overseeing quite a bit or overseeing everything, but a lot of people doing uh, the work. And that's uh, really what this whole uh, strategic plan has been focused on, is how do you help the kids learn? And so we're seeing that progress, which is extremely positive. And I don't want us to lose sight of that for, uh, you know, a discussion around the Civil War. <laughs> I mean, I get your point that we, we need to think about the organization of things, but I think we also have to celebrate a lot of work that happened over the past year in the middle of the pandemic when nothing was, uh, there was a prescription for nothing. And so this team has worked extremely hard. Phil, you've done a fabulous job in taking, uh, the, the money from 2021 budget uh, and using it appropriately and, and preparing us for this next year, which is going to be a big year of spending uh, additional ESSER funds and balancing everything uh, as, as we make investments in the students of Normandy. Um, and it's so exciting to see the building projects underway. Uh, and that is exactly what we envisioned when we thought about the bond proposal and we thought about uh, what sort of environment we could build for our kids, where they want to come to school, where they want to learn, uh, where they are learning. And uh, I, I just think it's exciting to see a lot of this come to fruition in the midst of so much turmoil, whether it be COVID related, whether it be uh, community related, whether it be whatever it is, a lot has been accomplished, and I want to thank everybody in this room for your hard work. Mr. Bill, you have any comments? Yeah, I, uh, I do a lot of what um, Sarah said, and also um, I'm very encouraged with the attendance, because I believe that attendance drives everything. The kids are not here, none of us are here now. So um, I'm good with the students here. I'm very encouraged by that. So thank you. And uh, the only comment I have is thank you to each of the board members that have engaged in tonight's meeting because I think we've had some very meaningful discussion. I'm excited about the retreat coming up in August because I know that there's some very important work that we have to do. I know we're down to the uh, bottom of the meeting and I know we're going into executive session. So I guess at this point, uh, if we can get roll call to uh, uh, go into executive session um, and then we'll conclude this meeting at, after we com, uh, conclude executive session. So if you go ahead and, and give us roll call for executive session. Mr. Jones? Uh, <coughs> yes. Ms. Watson? Here. Mr. Neal? Here. Ms. Williams? Yes. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Hunt? Yes. 
here. Uh, so we're going to go into executive session. I would take, let's take a three to five minute recess to uh, uh, take care of any personal needs and then we'll come back and we'll go into executive session and, and get through the items we have.